What is the way of the superior man? The way of the superior man is about giving. It's about giving who you are to the world. And it's about giving yourself more and more deeply to the world, to your woman, to your family, to everyone. To do this, we need to grow. And we grow through three basic stages. The first stage is when we want to grow for our own sake. So as a man, we might say, I'd like to make some money for myself. And if we are in the first stage, that's as far as we go. We choose to make money for our own sake. Over time, we grow to what I call the second stage, which is when we want to share and cooperate with other people. So as a man, we may feel, I would like to make money not only for my sake, but to take care of my family, to invest in the community, and to better the world. So whereas the first stage is about making yourself more full, better, acquiring more money, and the second stage is about sharing with others, being cooperative, working for the sake of the whole. The third stage is about realizing that everything is only change. Everything changes. Who you are changes. Everything you build changes. And change means death. So the beginning of the way of the superior man means to come to terms with not only your own death, but the death of everything you can build, create, and make. In the third stage of our life, when we're here to give, we are coming from the depths of our heart, feeling our deepest purpose, offering our love outward, and we realize nobody may accept what we have to give. Our art that we create may not be received. Our love that we have to give may not be received. A superior man does not stop giving merely because he's not received. He may never be acknowledged. He may never receive what he feels he deserves for what he gives. But the superior man is the giving. He lives as a gift. To do so, he needs to feel deep within himself and deeply into the world at the same time. So the superior man feels deeply in himself, who am I? Who am I most deeply? To give your deepest gift, one must know, who am I? So to feel who am I at my most deepest place is the beginning of relaxing as a superior man. To feel who am I leads you to feel that you are the witness of everything. You're not just your name. You're clearly not your body, the cells of which change all the time. When you were 10 years old, every cell of your body was probably pretty much different than it is today. So you're not your body. Likewise, your mind has changed since you were a child, and yet you still feel like you are the same person. So there is a continuity of a sense of self, even though everything changes. So that continuity or that unchanging sense of self amidst constant change, is what I call the masculine. The consciousness that you are, you are conscious of everything. That consciousness that you are is your masculine. The more you are identified with your deep consciousness, that which never changes, that which has no specific form, that which is eternal, the more you are identified with that, the more you are identified with what I call your masculine. The more you are identified with everything that changes, your thoughts, your body, your relationships, the world, then the more you are identified with the feminine, in the way I use the term. So the feminine is everything that moves, everything you could see, everything you could smell, everything you could hear, everything you could taste, everything you think, your mind's motion, is a feminine dance. Your heart beating, the stars circling through the cosmos, is the feminine. So your relationship to the world and to your body is your relationship to her, to the feminine. And your identity as unchanging consciousness 
is your identity as a masculine player in the world. All men and women, obviously, are both conscious and are conscious of everything that's changing. So all men and women have both masculine and feminine aspects. So every man and woman, in a moment when they're identifying with their unchanging consciousness, they're identifying with their masculine. Every man and woman, the moment they're identifying with everything that changes, their bank account, their thoughts, the world's political situation, the more somebody is identified with the flow of change, the more they are identified with the feminine. So all of us have both masculine and feminine. But to keep this simple, I'll talk about a man identified more with his masculine and a woman identified more with her feminine. As we grow in our lives through the stages, we approach the masculine and feminine differently. So in the first stage, when we're very selfish and self-centered, we tend to become rigid in our identity. A good way to feel into this first stage approach is to think of perhaps the 1950s in the United States, where men were men and women were women, where men were identified with only the masculine, that which doesn't change, no emotion, kind of stolid. And the women, again, this is the old style, first stage, 1950s, you can imagine. The women were identified with change, with beauty, with the beauty of the house, with their children. And we've grown out of these roles, thankfully. So now both men and women can exercise their masculine and feminine freely. But what that has resulted in is a kind of neutralization. Because if every human being expresses equal amounts of masculine and feminine expression, then there is no polarity. Sexual polarity is the arc of energy, either attractive energy or sometimes even repulsive energy. Sexual polarity is this arc of energy between masculine and feminine poles. Like all natural energies, you need two poles to create a force field. So, for instance, for the electrical force to flow, you need a positive and negative pole. That's why your car battery has two poles. That's why the electrical socket has a positive and negative side for two prongs, because you need two poles to create the arc of electrical force. Likewise, the gravitational field of the Earth is created between the north pole and south pole of the Earth. Well, the two poles of sexual attraction are masculine and feminine. So even if two human beings are completely balanced human beings and they can equally access their masculine and feminine, in the moments that they want sexual attraction within their intimacy, it's important to understand that what creates that sexual passion is the arc, the distance between masculine and feminine. So the woman may choose to play the masculine while the man chooses to play the feminine, or the man can choose to play the masculine and the woman play the feminine. Or in a gay or lesbian relationship, two same-sexed individuals can play it. One can play the masculine, the other the feminine. And as long as in any particular moment, one partner is playing more of the masculine, that is identification with unchanging consciousness, and one partner is identified with the feminine, identification with movement, life force, light itself, the dance of light, the cosmic motion. When one person is identified with the masculine and one is identified with the feminine, in that moment, there will be sexual polarity. However, if two people are in their masculine, two people are in their feminine, or two people are balanced or neutral, then although they may love each other deeply, there will not be the arc of sexual polarity. So what we're talking about here is a very specific situation. We're talking about men who have already grown beyond balance. So there are many men who are still trying to grow from the first to the second stage. They're trying to grow from being, let's call them, let's say, macho jerks and their partners submissive housewives. If we want to caricature, to make it easy to remember the first stage style of being stuck in these rigid roles of masculine and feminine, they grow to the second stage. And to grow to the second stage, men cultivated their internal feminine and women cultivated their internal masculine. So as men cultivated their internal feminine, they grew their hair longer and wore earrings perhaps, played music, maybe used marijuana or danced in the woods, played drums, sang together, expressed their feelings. 
All the things that women, of course, have been doing forever here in the United States, the men finally learned to do in the 1960s and 70s. And women, likewise, cultivated their internal masculine to grow into the second stage. They, uh, so to speak, burnt their bras. They learned how to express themselves as men did, how to interject their opinions into conversations, how to intervene, how to put themselves in the world, make decisions, say no, draw strong boundaries. So women cultivated their masculine, men cultivated their feminine, and became balanced whole people in the second stage. And then, of course, the main complaint, in intimacy, women often feel, why doesn't my man know his direction? Where has the passion gone? Men often feel, why doesn't my woman trust me? Why doesn't she invite me into her heart? And so what happens in the second stage is we become whole and independent, rather than partial and dependent, like in the first stage. But this isn't the end. Whole and independent people is not the meaning of life. It's a stage along the way. And the next stage is to surrender open and to give our deepest gifts however they come, masculine or feminine. So the third stage, man or woman, is completely free to give their masculine or feminine gifts in any way they would like. If a man wants to flow with energy and allow himself to feel the healing force of life through his body and heal other people with his energy, which is a feminine gift, he's certainly free to do so. And if a woman would like to cultivate her capacity to ignore her personal relationships and focus on, for instance, a financial bottom line, a corporate decision in the future, she's certainly free to become a corporate executive or a CEO and work hard all day to achieve a certain goal as men have been doing for years. So she can use her masculine to make goals and achieve goals. Women can also use their feminine. And likewise, men can use their masculine or their feminine. The way of the superior man is for people who have already achieved masculine and feminine balance. Men and women, men and men, women and women, who could look into each other's eyes and see God. They could look into each other's eyes and see love. They can feel each other's hearts without any boxing, putting people in a box of masculine or feminine. So in the third stage, in the way of the superior man, there is no boxing of masculine and feminine. It's offered freely. But within that free offering, we understand that if we want sexual polarity in our intimacies, if we want sexual polarity in our intimacies, which not everybody does, but if we do, then we must understand how sexual polarity, passion, is created and destroyed, which are the dynamics between the masculine and feminine. And we also need to learn the difference between doing something for our own sake, the first stage, doing something for the sake of everybody, that is, for the good of everyone, which is the second stage, or doing something because we feel an impulse beyond our personal lives, but also beyond everyone else's personal lives. There's a depth of being, a depth of love, a depth of consciousness that is coming through all of us that goes beyond all of our personal needs and also all of our collective needs. So the superior man over time more and more allows the force of this light or love or consciousness to come through their life into the world, into their relationships. And in doing that, they understand the yoga or the practices involved in the masculine and feminine dynamic. It is a true art. So the superior man understands the art of sexual polarity as well as the art of living from his deepest depth, knowing his deepest purpose. And again, that purpose grows through three stages. What is my purpose? Because I need to know it for myself, first stage. How does my purpose integrate with everyone else's purpose so we could create heaven on earth, so we could make this world, this community of ours, this human community, a better place to live? So there's your purpose for making this place a better world to live in. And then the third stage purpose is grounded in something beyond your own sense of personal need, and it's also grounded in something beyond the collective need. It's grounded in something that actually transcends this lifetime. So for the superior man to find his true purpose and live it fully through his body, with his women, with his life, with his family, with the world, 
for him to live that deepest purpose, he must find a way of sourcing himself in that deep purpose. For most men, this requires a kind of meditative practice or at least substantial time in solitude so that the motions of life, the feminine aspects of life, everything that changes, the attention to those changes is relaxed and so the man can simply feel and be awareness, feel and be love itself. And through this practice of relaxing and breathing and feeling at the most fundamental level, who am I? You can begin to relax. And as you relax, the separation between inside and out begins to dissolve. So there simply is light, alive as the world, she, the feminine. And there is consciousness, conscious of her dance, he, the masculine. Now, when we identify with that deep consciousness, we are, man or woman, feeling and therefore expressing our masculine principle. When we are identified with the light of the world, the life force of the world itself, then we are identified with the feminine. We need to understand these differences to play the masculine and feminine game in this human domain with love and joy and freedom and artistry. So we will look at the masculine and feminine play. We will look at the three stages. We will look at how to source our sense of purpose in not our first stage selfishness and not our second stage sense of sharing, but most profoundly into our third stage divinity. What is our divine purpose? How is that expressed uniquely through the body you were born with? How is that expressed uniquely through the mind you were born with? How is that expressed uniquely through the specific relationships that you have? The relationship with your love partner, the relationship perhaps with your children, your parents, your family. So one beginning step for the superior man is to relax into that which came before his birth, which is here now, and which will also be here after his death. So the superior man engages in whatever unique meditative or contemplative process whereby he begins to feel on a moment-by-moment -moment basis who he is beyond this life. And it is only when one is sourced in that which is alive, which is livingness itself, with or without your personal birth. It's only when we're sourced in something that can never end and has never started, that our gestures are full and spontaneous and communicate a kind of living conscious light because we are speaking, moving, touching, acting, earning our money from, creating our family from, our deepest source. In our culture today, we have very little practices for men to feel into their deepest purpose. Therefore, most men, as they grow from childhood into adolescence and young adulthood, begin to function from more superficial desires. So we can talk about desires that are more surface or superficial and desires that are more deep or sourced in divinity, in God, in our deepest heart. If we begin living from the basis of our superficial desires, for instance, our fears, rather than what we love, then our life begins to become structured around our fears. One of the main fears that many men have is fear of not enough money. And so frequently, one of the first major mistakes men make in their life is choosing ways of making money that have nothing to do with their sense of deep purpose because they've lost touch with their sense of deep purpose. So in their late teenage years and then into their 20s, when they finish high school, maybe go to college or get a job or develop their profession, the decisions most men make are not sourced in the feeling of, I am consciousness, I love the world. How can I give this love to the world so that the world becomes brighter rather than darker? 
how can I bring light into the world, into my relationships, into my own body? Instead of that, most men feel, I'm afraid I won't have enough money. Here's an opportunity, some random opportunity comes up, and they begin working. Years can go by. They can even have children on this basis without it being a deep aspect of an expression of their purpose. They might get married on the basis of their fears. And soon a man finds himself perhaps in a relationship that he built because he was afraid, perhaps even in a family situation that is riddled with fear, perhaps working at a job that, although it's doable, it doesn't express his deepest heart's yearning. And so it's easy in the middle of your life to find yourself living a life that feels apart from who you are. You may not even have a sense of who you are anymore. You may have lost touch with how you would express that in the world. And here today, you might find yourself surrounded by all the artifacts, the acquisitions, the relationships that you've created or acquired based on your neediness or your fear, rather than based on your deepest love and what you would love to give, what you're here to give. So what most men need to reestablish the source of their purpose is a formal period of solitude, isolation, and non-distraction. This formal period could be a kind of meditative or contemplative time done every day for perhaps a half an hour, say, or an hour every day, or for a more intense delving into your purpose. You might want to set aside a whole day of silence and no distractions, or even a week, or perhaps every 10 years. You might take a month or three months if you can arrange it in your life. But whatever you are ready for, the best way to feel into your deepest purpose, the best way to regain contact with your true source, is to stop doing and start feeling now. So you could sit in silence, close your eyes, and relax. Don't pick up the newspaper, don't pick up a magazine, don't turn on the TV. Thoughts may come and thoughts may go, and just feel the source of every thought coming and going. As you practice feeling the source of every thought coming and going, and as you deeply relax as that source, over time, hours, weeks, months, that source will begin to speak quietly. It will begin to communicate to you what it wants to do. You will simply feel an impulse, like a bubble rising from the deepest place in the ocean to express itself on the surface. You will find that the bubble, your impulse of love, comes from your deep well of being and bubbles up to the surface to express itself in life when you stop distracting yourself from that process. So we all need periods of solitude and isolation in order to reconnect with our deepest motive, which is always continuous with something before and after this birth. Another way to ask this question to a man about his deepest purpose is what would you need to do or what would you need to become before you die so you can die complete? What would you need to accomplish in the next three days or who would you need to become in the next three days? If you knew you would be dead in three days and you wanted to die in bliss because you had used your life to give everything, you had given everything you could, given your own limits and the world's limits and the time's limits, you have given everything you could. That is how we fall asleep in peace at night, because we have lived a full day and given everything. And that is how we die completely, because we have lived a full life and given everything. So, in addition to the periods of solitude and isolation, there is also the ongoing question, what do I need to do or become 
so I can die complete, I can die full. Now those practices of contemplation and meditative solitude, as well as constantly asking and error correcting, what do I need to give so I can die complete? What do I need to be so I can die complete? What do I need to do so I could die complete? In addition to those practices, we do need to earn a living. We do need to take care of our families. We do need to take care of our earth. Part of our born responsibility is simply as a human. And so what masculine integrity means is setting up your life in whatever way you need to today so you can earn a living, take care of those you're responsible for, take care of the world both locally and as wide as you can reach. But in the meantime, you're always feeling all of this passes. No matter what art I create, no matter how much money I make, no matter how good I am to my children or my wife, everyone dies. All efforts dissolve. Nothing lasts. And so the superior man is always giving and letting go, giving and letting go, giving and letting go. The results of your giving are easy to predict. Whatever you build will fall apart. Whatever relationships you acquire, you will lose. Whatever you create in the world will be perhaps appreciated, perhaps rejected, and over time certainly forgotten. Everything you give is only light dissolving into its own source's consciousness. And to feel this while you are earning a living, while you are practicing your moments, days, or weeks of solitude to discover and ground yourself in your deepest purpose, while you are also offering your gift, what do I need to give so I could die complete? We are always feeling everything passes. Everything. So our hearts become incredibly vulnerable, incredibly sensitive. Our hearts become feeling organs. We begin to feel the space around us from our heart. The space around us becomes living. Over time, we no longer feel as if we are a separate body, separate from other people, separate from the space around us. Of course, at one level, we are a separate body. But as our feeling becomes deeper, we realize that all of this is happening together. It's a huge mystery. We have no idea why we ended up the way we are. We have no idea what's going to happen the next moment to us or to anyone else. We live in an unknowable, magical display of love. And the superior man sources himself in the deepest consciousness to give his gift over time while taking care of the practical events necessary in life. So the first thing to remember is do not postpone the giving of your deepest gift because you don't know what your deepest gift is yet or because you have to earn money doing something else in the meantime. Whatever you have to do to earn money, at least set aside some period of time every day, perhaps a half an hour a day, where today you are giving your deepest gift, the gift you feel you were born to give. Over time, that may change. Tomorrow, you may find a deeper way to give that gift. But for now, what is the deepest way to offer yourself? And can you do it as a discipline for half an hour today, even though you have to make a living? even though the house may need taking care of, even though you may have responsibilities for most of the day, do not postpone one more day living your deepest gift. So the superior man always makes time now, today, to live how they need to live, to give what you need to give, so you could die complete if today was your last day. How do you know your deepest purpose when your mind is constantly changing? Yesterday, you might have felt one thing, but today, when you wake up, you feel something else. How do you stay on track? Your relationship to your own changing mind and your relationship to your own changing body is your relationship to the feminine. Your changing mind, that is the flow of your thoughts and the flow of your body, those are the feminine. 
They are change. They are motion. They are life expressing itself. So for you to discover your deepest masculine purpose requires that you develop the capacity basically to simply love your mind and body as they change without believing what your mind and body are telling you too much. To do this, you must understand that everything in your mind is sourced in consciousness. Your mind is just a display of conditioning of your past, of thoughts, of things people have told you, things you have read, your own ideas, things you've watched on TV, all of which changes. Think back 10 years and you'll probably think, well, I thought I knew what was going on then, but now I'm 10 years older and now I really know what's going on. But of course, in another 10 years, you'll feel like what you knew now is very immature. We are constantly growing. Therefore, to trust your own mind is a mistake. To trust your own body is a mistake. Of course, to grow from the first to the second stage, to grow from dependence to independence, we learn to trust our own mind and body so we could make our own decisions and we're not dependent on others. Again, as always, I'm speaking of moving from the second to the third stage. And to do that, we realize that our mind and body are worthy of love. They are not something to be listened to as if they're telling us what to do. We are much deeper and much bigger than our minds and bodies. Our sense of purpose is not discovered in anything we can think. So however long it takes a man to realize that as thoughts come and go, his sense of purpose stays the same. However long it takes him to realize that, that's how long it will take for him to flail in life, to try one thing, then the next day his mind says something else, so he tries something else. And of course, because he can't stay on a single track, his intimate partner, presuming that his intimate partner is more identified with the feminine, so I'll say she, as if she's a woman, although of course someone's intimate partner could be male or female, and also more identified with the masculine or feminine, but to keep this example simple, I'll talk about a man identified more with his masculine and a woman partner identified more with her feminine. If he's changing his mind, so he wakes up one day and his purpose is X, and then he the next day wakes up and his purpose is Y, and his woman feels him flipping and flopping and unsure, she, of course, won't be able to trust that depth because she will feel him attending to the fluctuating thoughts of his mind rather than the eternity that he knows in his heart. So as a woman, as a feminine identified being, she will only learn to trust her partner's masculine when she feels it grounded in that which does not change. The expression is always changing. It's like an artist, any artist, Picasso, Rembrandt, painting essentially the same painting over and over, deeper and deeper in different ways, exploring how to express a fundamental realization. So the expression changes over time. But if it's true, if it's real, if it's sourced in depth, then that depth always comes through the expression. So in some ways it feels like the expression evolves, but the transmission is always the same through the expression. And that's what the partner of a superior man feels, that although his ideas change, his expression changes and evolves over time, that depth is always tangible through all of his expressions. Now for a man to express that depth through all of his expressions requires that he has the capacity to feel depth and love the dancing mind, the dancing body, and his partner dancing. Therefore, a man can cultivate the capacity to feel his lover as she is without trying to change her and without necessarily believing what she says any more than he believes his own mind. He feels the thoughts arising from her source and his source and expressing themselves and changing over time. But he listens to them more like he would listen to a song, a symphony, or he would listen to wind blowing through the leaves in the woods or the ocean crashing on the beach. It's beautiful to listen to and sometimes great insights can come from listening. 
but it doesn't tell you what to do. Rather, it's an expression of your deepest heart that's coming forth. Instead of tending to your expression, tend to the source in order for your expression to stay continuous with your source. How do we do that? A lot of it is emotional. A lot of it is simply our emotional relationship to the feminine. Are we willing to feel the constantly changing feminine without hoping that one day the feminine will make sense? One of the masculine mistakes is to attempt to resolve the ever-changing feminine into a singular resolution. So in an argument between a masculine partner and a feminine partner, the masculine partner is always saying, well, make up your mind, or what's the point? What are you trying to say? Because he's trying to resolve the discussion to a point, to an understanding that can end the discussion. But the feminine doesn't want to bring anything to the end. The feminine is constant change, constant motion, constant life, always changing. So if a man thinks that his mind will ever resolve itself into a single purpose, he simply has got the wrong assumption. The mind always dances. She is always dancing. The feminine, the divine feminine, as well as the feminine form in the shape of your woman, is motion itself. She has a masculine aspect. She can certainly source her expression in the masculine just like you. But when she's sourcing her expression in her feminine, it is very much like the expression of feminine on earth, the weather, the ocean, storms, hurricanes, tsunamis, sunny days, rainy days. That's the feminine. That is your mind. Some days your mind feels like a storm. Sometimes your mind feels like sun. Sometimes your mind feels clear. Sometimes it's cloudy. And the same thing with your woman. Sometimes she feels happy, sometimes sad. Sometimes she sounds like she hates you. Sometimes she sounds like she loves you. All of that is her dance. If you are practicing the way of the superior man, it means to embrace that dance in love. It means to feel every nuance of her dance, every nuance of her expression, every nuance of your own mind, to pay complete attention with utter feeling, heart sensitivity, and vulnerability, and at the same time to source yourself in death. That is, what lies beneath this moment? What is deeper than everything that appears? What was before you were born and will be after you die? Not as a theoretical exercise, not as a philosophical exercise, but as an in-the-moment realization, a feeling realization, so that as your mind keeps changing, so that one day you wake up and you feel your purpose is to open a new business, and the next day you wake up and you feel like your purpose is to write a novel, and the next day you wake up and you feel your purpose is to have a family, and as you express these purposes to your woman, she gets upset. Why can't you make up your mind? What's happening? Who's going to pay the rent? Don't you have a plan? As all of this is happening, you continually feel into the deepest part of your being, which is the deepest part of all being. And from that depth, you learn to embrace and dance with the feminine. Dancing itself is simple motion. It has no depth to it. But if you're sourced in your masculine consciousness and dancing, then the dance is life and your masculine consciousness brings the depth dimension or death. Life and death as one, depth and motion as one. The unchanging eternity is the source for all that is only changing, including your mind. You will never know your purpose in mind, ever. Your mind is only change. Your purpose is sourced in where you go when you fall asleep and deeper. Your purpose is sourced in where you were born from and where you are being born moment by moment. From that unchanging depth of being, you dance with her. 
That is, you dance with your mind and your body. You dance with your lover. You dance with the world. You dance with your children. You dance with the political situation of the earth. You dance with the weather. You wear a raincoat when it rains. You do what you need to do to dance, to love, to live. And you do not lose continuity with that which never changes, with that which we die into, moment by moment, and then are reborn from, giving birth from moment by moment. So if you're waiting to know your purpose in your mind, you will literally be waiting your entire life. But if you stop waiting for your mind to reflect your purpose, if you stop waiting for your woman to reflect your purpose, if you stop waiting for the world to reflect your purpose, and instead feel your motivation from your deepest consciousness, and then express it into the world of woman, of purpose, of mind and body, that is the beginning of living as a superior man in the world. As a man, your relationship to your own mind and body is your relationship to the feminine, to women. Again, in all of these discussions, we could be talking about gay relationships, straight relationships, bisexual relationships. We could be talking about women more identified with their masculine or men more identified with their feminine. But to keep it simple, I'll just speak about men identified with their masculine, women identified with their feminine just to make it easy to talk about. Again, a man's relationship to his own body and mind is his relationship to women and to his woman in specific. So for instance, do you believe what your mind says? Well, hopefully you listen to your mind. There is some wisdom inherent in your mental fluctuations, but also there's just movement you probably have been in bad moods and thought about all kinds of dark things only next day to be in a good mood and think all kinds of good things. The mind is like that. The feminine is like that. The weather is like that. The world is like that. And women are like that. So how, as a masculine identified man, do you deal with the feminine aspect of women? Women, of course, could be in their masculine depth just like you can. Women can speak from their masculine depth just like you can. But especially in intimacy, when you are polarizing your partner, especially in love intimacy, where your partner may lovingly, deliciously relax into her feminine in polarized, passionate play with you and your masculine, in those moments, she is speaking from her feminine. It is like the weather speaking. And so often men, especially who haven't had much experience in this area, feel, wow, my woman says this, and then she changes her mind. Uh, is she lying? Is she lying on purpose? Sometimes she changes her mind every five minutes. Well, if you feel your own mind, you will see that sometimes your mind changes too. In fact, it is only change. And so what your woman is saying could be felt as the poetry of her heart in the moment. When your woman is in her feminine, her words are expressing the poetry of her heart in the moment. When she says, I don't want to go to the movies tonight, she may actually be saying something's off in our relationship and we need to talk about it. But instead, when you say, would you like to go to the movies? Instead of saying, ah, oh, something's off in our relationship, we need to talk about it, she might say, no, I don't want to go to the movies. Well, if you just listened to her, then you wouldn't go to the movies. But what would happen if, when she said, no, I don't want to go to the movies, you felt her, you looked into her eyes, perhaps embraced her, sat down with her, maybe talked about what you needed to, opened her heart in love, stood up with her, put on some beautiful music, danced for a few moments, looked into her eyes and said, do you want to go to the movies now? She may very well say, yes, because what she was talking about had nothing to do with her desire to go to the movies. What she was saying had everything to do with her desire to dance with you. And so women are not liars. The feminine is not lying. Weather does not lie. It simply doesn't represent anything other than its own expression. 
And so as a man, you need to simply learn to feel the feminine's expression. Take it to heart. There's often much wisdom, much intuitive depth, a deeper connection than you may ever have to the nuances of life that can be very informative to you. And everything she says could also be an expression of her depth of feeling in the moment, simply an expression of the weather of her mind, of her heart, of her body, of the community. So women are not liars. The feminine does not lie. The feminine simply expresses the flow that is true in this moment. The same is true of your own mind. And so in learning to relate to your own mind, loving your own mind, embracing your own mind, trusting that your own mind is sourced in depth, and also knowing that the way your mind is expressing is simply a shimmer, simply a momentary bubble on the surface, a wave on the surface of the ocean. That allows you to stay sourced in depth while your mind changes or your woman's mind changes. So trying to ask your partner, trying to ask your woman, how do you feel, often makes the situation worse. Why? Because how she feels isn't necessarily able to be put into words. Words, especially the way masculine people use them, a linear sequence of words that add up to an expression that can be more or less true compared to other expressions, that way of using words doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means. Asking your woman, how do you feel, is sometimes like taking the ocean and putting it into a little box. The ocean is huge. How your woman feels probably has to do with the color of shoes she chose to wear today, how the weather is outside, whether you kissed her long and deep or short and sharp, the tone of your voice, the way her children related to her, the dreams she had, the food she ate, all of this is, of course, contributing to how she feels. So to ask a woman how she feels when she's in her feminine is very much like asking a windstorm, why are you windy? The windstorm is related to so many things. Hot air currents in South America, cold water currents in Antarctica, all of that contributes to all local weather. Similarly, the reasons your woman feels what she feels are huge, immense, and unknowable. Sometimes, of course, there's a practical reason just to ask, why are you feeling what you're feeling? But more often, the actual answer is so complex, so related to so much, that just to ask that question changes how she's feeling. So as she begins to answer, well, how am I feeling? I'm feeling happy. But as soon as she says happy, she realizes that just you asking her made her feel a little angry. So I'm feeling happy, angry, but good you asked. But why did you ask? Just asking the question shifts the feminine flow. So instead of analyzing her feelings, embrace them. Again, it is much more like a dance, an embrace, a love gesture of inclusion, of holding her heart to yours. So heart to heart, you can actually feel what she's feeling. By cultivating your capacity to feel into her heart, you don't need to ask her how she feels. You can feel how she feels. In a third stage relationship, in fact, you realize that quite often you can feel your lover's heart much more deeply than she can. And she can feel your heart more deeply than you can. And so it is through the eyes and hearts of our lover that we come to know ourself even more fully than we could on our own. And this is the way of the superior man, to realize that what she shows you is often deeper than you can feel and see. And what you can show her is often deeper than what she can feel or see about herself. So in a third stage relationship, we come to trust the heart and vision of our chosen partner, and perhaps as well our chosen friends and teachers, more than our own ever dancing mind and image of ourself. 
So it is this depth of growing trust and vulnerability that allows you to stay in heart continuity with your lover, even as she says one thing and does something else. Even when your mind says one thing and does something else, you could sustain that heart continuity with your lover. And it's the sustaining of that heart continuity with your lover, breathing with her, feeling her heart, that allows her to come to trust you. She'll know then when your changing expressions are just neurotic and all over the place, or when your changing expressions are deeply sourced in your heart and are truly evolving over time, not randomly, but because of the deeper and deeper sourcing is occurring. She will learn when to trust you because you are really coming from your heart, from your depth, and when not to trust you because you're coming from a more superficial motive. It is this deepening of trust between you and your partner that leads into the third stage relationship, the relationship between a superior man and his chosen partner, a relationship in which our deepest heart values are expressed in our life and our partnership, rather than our minds and bodies merely being expressed. Our minds and bodies become expressions of our heart's depth. Therefore, to use your mind to analyze your partner's feelings, or to think your partner's lying because she says something and then changes her mind or does something entirely different. Those kind of behaviors are based on a wrong assumption. You are still assuming that the sound of the wind means something deeper than the sound of the wind. Whereas in fact, all of it is an expression of love. All of it is an expression of light. But to analyze what she means is almost by definition to reduce her to the limits of your own mind. And she is much deeper, much more complex, much more mysterious, much more full than your own verbal mind will ever be able to grasp. And so are you. Because the masculine is identified with unchanging consciousness, Discussions between a masculine character and a more feminine identified character always go something like this. And then the masculine character is trying to bring it to a final resolution. And he hopes that his partner likewise and the agreement is reached. End of conversation. Because the masculine is always trying to reduce everything to the simplest possible rules and always trying to bring the fullness of life to the emptiness of consciousness. So the masculine motive is always to bring things to an end, to allow the mind to become silent, to have sex which is filled with desires and then ejaculate and Ah, I'm free of desire, the blissful peace of nothingness. When masculine people drink alcohol, they like to drink alcohol and feel the nothingness of numbness, even drinking to the point of obliteration. Whereas the feminine way to use alcohol is drinking for more fullness, to dance and sing and talk with your friends in a less inhibited way. So any time we are moved towards emptying ourselves, which means becoming more free, no constraints, being empty of constraints, empty of boundaries, being free, we are exercising our masculine. And whenever we are moving towards fullness, more life, more fullness, we are moving towards greater love, we are exercising our feminine. In a conversation, therefore, the feminine partner is going to want the energy to continue. Life force is the feminine. Therefore, anger is an example of life force. Crying or sorrow is an example of life force. Those flows of anger and crying and sorrow, that is life. That is the feminine. There is no motive in the feminine to bring that to an end. Whereas the masculine partner is always 
feeling something like, hmm, there's anger, something's wrong, I have to make the anger go away, or hmm, she's crying, or I'm crying, something's wrong, we have to change it. There's nothing wrong. The feminine is motion and emotion. The feminine is the fluctuation of love, the waves on the ocean. That dance, that beauty, the sunlight glistening on those waves is the feminine. So when you are with your feminine partner, you will find that she does not want the intensity of a conversation, discussion, or argument to come to an end. In fact, if you're not giving her your deepest presence, which is what she wants from you, your deep heart presence, unwavering, feeling her, not running away, not trying to fix her, but really with her, feeling her. If you are not giving her that presence, then she will evoke that presence in any way she can. And to her, anything is better than nothing. Fullness is better than emptiness. Putting anything on an empty shelf is better than having an empty shelf in a feminine household. So if you walk into a feminine person's household, every shelf has objects on it, shells, feathers, photos, friends, all kinds of things. If you walk into a masculine person's household, it's all about space. You open the refrigerator and there's two batteries and a mustard. If you look at their CD collection, it's arranged alphabetically. Whereas the feminine, everything is filled. If there's a corner in the room that's empty, nothing delights her more than to go shopping to fill that corner with something beautiful, to fill with beauty, to bring life, to bring love. That is the feminine motive. Therefore, in a conversation, the masculine partner who is more identified with the unchangingness of consciousness is always trying to get the conversation to, got it? Do you have it? Do I got it? Are we done now? Can we agree? Can we just rest this conversation and get on with our life? Whereas to the feminine, the conversation is life. The conversation, the argument, the energy, whether it's angry or sorrowful or happy, is the meaning. She wants to feel that flow between the two of you. If it takes breaking your record collection so you get angry and yell at her, sometimes your angry yelling at her feels more full than your distant presence. If what she's used to is you sitting in front of the TV and not paying any attention to her, not giving her any of your presence, then even your angry presence is better than no presence at all. So, she will continually attempt to bring your presence forward by triggering all of your emotions, and probably nobody knows your weak links more than your woman. She knows just where to poke you so it hurts. She knows just what you doubt in yourself so when she questions it, you collapse. She knows just what to say to tick you off, to make you angry. And sometimes, especially if you're not giving her your deepest presence, she'd rather have the presence of your anger, let's say, than no presence at all. Understanding this, you realize your masculine tendency is always to bring a conversation to an end, to resolve a conversation with an answer. She, however, if she is moving from her feminine, has no desire to bring the conversation to an end. In fact, her desire is perhaps to intensify the exchange, to make the dance more passionate, more furious, more loving, more rich, more full. And so when talking to your woman partner, it's always important for your heart to embrace her values as much as yours. She is bringing you life. She is bringing you motion and emotion. She is the miracle of light and life and change and nature and every motion and emotion. You are that which is unaffected by motion and emotion. In some Hindu iconography from India, there are ancient paintings, hundreds and thousands of years old, that depict the feminine goddess Shakti, or Kali, standing above a blue corpse, which is Shiva, or the masculine divine. 
So there's a blue corpse, a man laying naked on his back on the ground. He is dead, although his face has a look of bliss, and he's often depicted as having an erection. And standing above him, often holding a sword or sometimes holding men's heads that she's just chopped off, is this wild, dancing, feminine, divine Shakti, or perhaps a Kali image. And that depicts the kind of conversation, if you will, between the superior man and his chosen woman. She will chop off his head if he is less than conscious. She will also make love with him to the end of time. But he must stay erect. He must stay alive in his feeling without reacting to what she says, without trying to box her in, without trying to analyze her. So to be already dead, yet filled with passion, you still have an erection, as in this Hindu iconography. That is, you are lying in bliss. She can dance. She can scream. She can cry. She can make love to you. She can chop off your head. You are resting in the depth of your death. You are resting in the bliss of being emptiness itself. And you allow her to be the fullness of every emotion and emotion. And more than allow her, you have no fear because you are already dead. You are already relaxed in the source of consciousness. And yet feeling her entirely, feeling every motion she makes, feeling how her eyes blink, feeling how her tongue moves, feeling the angle of her head, feeling the texture of her breath, feeling everything about her and still free of her while feeling her and ready to enter her. This is the way of the superior man to be already dead and yet embracing life completely, feeling her, able to enter her. But the common mistake is to feel that through conversation or even through spiritual practices, you can bring things to an end. She has no intention of bringing things to an end. She is motion. One of the most common misunderstandings of this kind of work is that men should do something and women should do something. Although sometimes I may say things like that in a shorthand kind of way. There is no universal answer. This is an art. It's the art of polarity. It's how do we use our depth of consciousness, which never changes, in relationship to that which is only changing and dancing and alive. How is that play lived out in human life? It's an art. And of course, I can give you some principles based on things that I've discovered myself, based on things my teachers have taught me, based on what my intimate partners have taught me. But in the end, this is your art. So you need to find a way to live your art of passion, your art of masculine and feminine polarity, and your art of living your gift in the world. Part of that in intimacy is to understand that the feminine enjoys testing the masculine's capacity to stay on track. Perhaps enjoy is a bit too anthropomorphic. It is automatic. She is feeling, does he stay in his deepest source, no matter how the world perturbs him, and no matter how I perturb him. Sometimes, in fact, if you ask women, they'll tell you that in the midst of a conversation with their man, they'll say things they don't even know why they're saying. They may even say something like, I hate you and I never want to see you, and then leave the room. Of course, not really meaning, I hate you and I never want to see you, although it's true enough to say in the moment, perhaps. So when, as a man, do you draw the line? Is she testing you? Is she giving you something to work with? How much time do you devote to listening to her? How much time do you devote to the relationship if you feel that all she's doing is testing you? Again, every relationship is different, so there's nothing I or anyone else can tell you that will apply in all situations. But what I can tell you is that if in your deepest heart you feel that your woman is making wrong decisions, and if you continue tolerating her wrong decisions without offering your guidance, 
then you will begin to resent her. You will begin to feel that she is doing something in relationship to you that's not helping the relationship, it's not helping her as an individual, it's not helping you as an individual, it's not helping your family or your community or the world. So at a very realistic level, how do you deal with this? When do you draw the line? Because you don't want to end up resenting your woman because you've tolerated her, you've let her go on and on and on, and you're going crazy inside her, you're just becoming numb. When do you draw the line? And how do you know if you're drawing the line for your selfish first stage purposes, your socially, politically correct second stage purposes, or if you're drawing the line because your deepest heart so loves your woman that you simply cannot let her continue for her own sake and the sake of everyone. Well, one way to feel into this is in the company of others, to sit down with a group of men friends and women friends with you and your partner and have them feel the two of you in a discussion and feel when is that line, where can that line be drawn, when is enough enough. So one way to feel when is enough enough is to ask your closest friends and her closest friends. But another way to feel it is simply to feel the tension in both of your bodies. If as your woman is speaking with you or being emotional with you and you feel that it's an excessive loop disconnected from her heart so that her emotions are merely emotions not emerging from her love depth, if that's what you feel, then it is your heart's obligation and your woman's deepest desire for your heart to draw the line. I love you and I cannot let you continue doing this because I love you so much. On the other hand, if you pull away from your woman when she is being intense with you and from that place of being pulled away, you draw the line and say, this is enough. It is no longer your heart, your deepest heart, your third stage depth drawing the line. Instead, it is your first stage neediness. Oh, this is difficult for me. This is too intense. I don't want to deal with this. Enough. That is your first stage line drawn. It's your selfishness. Some men have moved into the second stage, so instead of being macho jerks and just drawing a line and saying, hey, shut up, bitch, this is my way, you do what I say, the old-style first stage masculine, he's grown into the second stage masculine, which is a balanced masculine, balanced by his own internal feminine. So he might say, well, I hear what you're saying, and I want to give you space and tell you that I do appreciate that you've expressed yourself to me. I don't agree with you. And you can do what you do. I can't control your life, and I'll do what I need to do. So you're a whole independent person who I appreciate and I'm giving space to. And I'm a whole and independent person that I want you to give space to. And you do what you need to do, and I'll do what I need to do. And if we could come together in that, then it's beautiful. So that's the second stage. So a second stage man may say, hey, hey, wait a second. You're being too intense. Go pound on a pillow and get out your anger and then come back to me because you sound pretty crazy right now and I just don't want you in my space. I need my own space and you need to work this out yourself. That's the second stage. In the third stage though, even though your woman might be being emotionally intense or seemingly testing you, perhaps again in your reality, unnecessarily or excessively, in those moments you feel into her deepest heart. So let's say she's lost touch with her deepest heart and she's just blabbing on about something. Da -da 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 -da. This happened today. Mary said this. Joe did this. I'm feeling this. And you're realizing she's just tense and it's her tension speaking. Well, you may intervene in her tension and maybe embrace her so her body relaxes. Or you may be humorous with her for a few moments so she relaxes and has a larger perspective on the situation. You can breathe with her because breath is often an excellent way to communicate depth from body to body. But at some point, if you continue tolerating what she's giving you 
and she is not deepening. Her heart is not coming into play. It is not her love being expressed, but merely her tension. At some point, it is abusive, and it is self-abusive for you to subject yourself to that, just as it would be self-abusive for her to subject herself to your physical violence. It is equally self-abusive for you to subject yourself to her emotional violence, so to speak. So we must learn to draw the line for our own needs in the first stage, for social needs in the second stage. Hey, I need my own space. You need your own space. Take care of it. But in the third stage, we feel our partner's heart, and we only draw the lines that serve our heart, her heart, and everyone's heart. Again, this is a subtle matter, and it's an art. It's impossible to describe exactly what to say when any more than somebody would say how do I paint a masterpiece and it's impossible to tell somebody how to paint a masterpiece you could tell them how to combine colors how to follow the numbers connect the dots how to draw outline shadings perspective but in the end it's their masterpiece well your relationship is your masterpiece and you're co-creating it with your woman if you don't draw the line if you simply tolerate her as she goes on and on, you will be building resentment inside. Your painting will be covered in darkness and tension. But there are ways of saying enough is enough and your heart remains connected to her. So the key in saying and showing this is enough, enough and drawing the line, the key is does your heart remain connected to hers? Are you breathing with her? Are your muscles soft instead of rigid? Is your heart vulnerable instead of sheltered and shielded from your partner? Are you looking into her eyes instead of looking away? Are you feeling the motion of her body as if you were about to dance with her? Or are you pulling away so you don't feel her? If you're pulling away, if your eyes are closed or looking away, if your breath is not full, if your stomach is tense, if you feel upset and disgusted, that is not the time to draw the line. That is the time for you to learn to relax, feel her, deepen your heart, feel more deeply into her heart, breathe with her, feel her agitation, embrace her, feel her deepest heart's desires, connect your deepest heart's desires to her. And in that moment of your two hearts deeply connected, in that moment, if it's clear that a boundary needs to be established, I cannot tolerate this anymore, then you are drawing that line as an act of love. However, if you draw that line from tension and pulling away from her, then you are drawing that line from your own selfish need. You're not even feeling her. It has nothing to do with her. So tolerating her leads to resenting her. And when to draw the line is an art based on the depth of your heart connection with her. As we've said before, all men and all women have both masculine and feminine forces moving through them. The masculine in all of us grows through critical assessment and error correction. The fastest way for the masculine to grow is to be told what it's doing wrong so that the masculine can correct its error and do it right. So if you were in boot camp in the military or you're on a team, a sporting team, the coach or the captain might say, you dog, give me five push-ups. That was wrong. Do it better next time. You suck. Better, better, better. Man, I want to see your best. You're all little girls. So that kind of critical, critical assessment inspires the masculine. It's a challenge. It puts it on its edge. So the masculine grows through challenge and criticism so they can error correct. But the feminine in all of us grows through praise. If you see a woman exercising and you want her to continue exercising, you would praise her exercising. You would say, you're beautiful when you exercise. You look fantastic with sweat dripping down from you. I love to see you in your workout clothes. Rather than saying, you're too fat, exercise more. Again, the masculine grows through criticism. You're too fat, exercise. 
but the feminine grows through praise. I love when you exercise. You're so radiant, jogging, running, swimming. I love to see the glistening sweat flowing down your skin. The feminine grows through praise, whereas the masculine grows through challenge and criticism. By understanding these differences, we can serve our partner's growth, our friend's growth, our children's growth, and our own. All of us, every man and every woman, has both masculine and feminine within them. Therefore, if we want to experience the pleasure of uniting with the masculine or feminine outside of us, then we must relinquish within ourselves the quality that we want to receive through our partner. These are magnetic, polarized qualities, as we've already discussed in an earlier session. Masculine attracts feminine. Feminine attracts masculine, just like the north and south poles of the globe create a magnetic field, or positive and negative sides of an electrical plug creates an arc of electrical energy. Masculine and feminine create the arc of sexual attraction. If you want that arc of sexual attraction with your intimate partner, you must let go of the quality within yourself that you want to receive through your partner. So for instance, if a woman wants to receive masculine qualities through her partner, if she wants her man to be more decisive, if she wants her man to have a deeper sense of his purpose, if she wants her man to be able to know what he wants and listen to her and still guide his life without weakening himself, then she must trust his masculine more than hers. If she does not trust her partner's masculine more than her own masculine, then there won't be sexual polarity. She'll be trusting her own masculine more than his. She'll be whole onto herself, but she will not trust relinquishing her own inner masculine and trusting the direction of her partner. Remember that the masculine identifies with consciousness rather than all the changes in life. That allows someone who's relaxed as consciousness to see all the options. Rather than getting lost in the trees, you can see the whole forest and make a decision based on the whole picture. Whereas the feminine is in the moment, feeling the flows in the moment, the masculine pulls out of life and kind of looks at life from the outside and therefore can pick a direction and see how to follow the path to achieve that goal. Another way of saying this is if a woman wants her man to offer his direction and to know his direction and to be clear about his direction, then in moments of intimacy, she can relinquish her own sense of direction, however highly developed it may be, in order to allow her partner the opportunity to exercise and cultivate and deepen his capacity to know his direction and to guide and direct a relationship to ever deeper and more amazing openings. Likewise, the masculine character relinquishes his own feminine and receives the feminine through his partner. Again, he must trust the feminine of his partner more than his own feminine. For instance, if he looks at himself in a mirror and his own radiance, his own life force makes him happier than his woman's, she will be upset. If he spends more time combing his hair, more time looking into the mirror, more time making himself be a goddess, more time showing his own radiance, then he does receiving and appreciating with deep gratitude the radiance of his chosen woman, then there won't be polarity. So the masculine partner then relieves himself of the need of animating his own feminine temporarily, 
and in moments of intimacy then becomes whole through receiving his partner's feminine. So to move into this third stage as we've described it requires trusting parts of your partner more than yourself. In specific, it means as a man who's playing the masculine side in intimate moments, it means trusting the feminine of your woman partner. Trusting that feminine is the light of love. And when you trust that and you feel that, you also know that nothing on earth is more beautiful and more attractive than the feminine and the human feminine form and expression is the most attractive to the human masculine. You will always be attracted to feminine energy. You will want to dive into the ocean. You will want to climb the mountain. You will want to enjoy nature. When you see women throughout the day, depending on the exact quality of their feminine expression, you will feel as if you are seeing pieces of art walking around your life, sunsets every day through every woman's eyes, the glory of the This concludes session one. Our program continues with session two, Dealing with Women with David Data. and south poles of magnetic flow. It happens automatically. It's not personal. You may not even like a woman, let alone have any intention of having a relationship with them, and still be totally sexually attracted based on the mere fact that you're in your masculine and she's in her feminine. So, you will always be sexually attracted to the flavors of sexual energy that you are not receiving in the rest of your life. If you are not receiving certain parts of the spectrum of feminine energy, the rainbow of feminine energy, if you are not receiving certain colors in that rainbow, you will begin to hunger for them like nutrients. It's very similar if you don't have salt in your diet, you begin craving salt. Sometimes if you don't eat enough sweets, you begin craving sweets. If you only eat sweets, you begin craving something spicy, something peppery. If you only eat peppery things, you begin to crave something cooling. Well, remember, the feminine is life force. So that means that every feminine being brings you a different quality in this rainbow of feminine possibilities. Whereas the masculine is unchanging consciousness, there is only one masculine depth, the feminine is the complete spectrum of energy and life force. There's infinite expressions of the feminine, which is why both men and women want multiplicity when it comes to the feminine. Women, when buying shoes or shopping for clothing or going out to eat, have the same relationship to the food, the shoes, or the clothing that men have to women. That is, when a woman goes shopping, she's going shopping to feel the energy, the fullness of the feminine. She's 
selecting fabrics that feel beautiful, that look beautiful, or perhaps she's selecting scents, perfumes that smell a certain way. She has very specific qualities she's looking for and wearing the same shoes day after day after day or wearing the exact same outfit, the exact same colors day after day after day, eating the same exact meal, even if you love it, eating the same ice cream sundae for breakfast, lunch, and dinner day after day after day results in ill health. Variety is the nature of the feminine. When women are looking for shoes, it's the variety of shoes that are possible. So one day she wants a high heel, one day she wants a lower heel, one day she might want a brown leather, one day a black leather. And each of those qualities make her feel full or not. They heal her. Well, in the same way, when men are looking at women, some days a man feels a spicy hot woman gives him the quality of energy that opens him. Sometimes a cooling icy woman. Sometimes a super sexually charged woman turns him on and fills him with life. Sometimes a demure and shy woman turns him on. Sometimes a woman expressing tiger-like energy. Sometimes a woman expressing hurricane-like energy. So the feminine comes in a variety, a spectrum of beauty, of forms, of nutrients, of colors, of energy. And both men and women want to experience that full feminine spectrum through the variety of food they eat, which is energy, through the variety of clothing and colors, which are forms of energy, and for men, through the variety of women they interact with through the day. Therefore, most men spend most days desiring a variety of women sexually to combine and merge with them just as a woman might choose to merge with an ice cream sundae one day and then a piece of chocolate cake another day and then a, some coffee and a croissant another day. In the same way, men choose different flavors or energies of feminine energy in order to touch their needs, in order to heal their wounds, in order to be nutrients to their soul. And so as a man walks through the day and walks down the street, he's feeling this woman who's more like a tiger or this woman who's more like a cool lake of water. And depending on his energy needs, he responds sexually. These sexual responses to various forms of feminine energy is natural, it's universal, it's innocent, it happens to everyone. It's very much like a woman walking by a restaurant and smelling some delicious meal as she walks by and going, mmm. Well, that quality of mmm doesn't end her relationship with her man any more than the man's quality of mmm towards different qualities of feminine energy ends his relationship with his chosen woman. That is, your commitment in relationship is very different than your sexual attraction. You will feel sexual attraction to any woman who is your reciprocal. You will also feel sexual attraction to places that are your reciprocal energies. If you have a lot of masculine energy flowing through you, then going to a place like Hawaii feels almost sexually alive because of the polar dynamic between the masculine in your body and the feminine life force of the island. So you will be sexually attracted to all kinds of things, places, objects, and women. There is a yogic art of breathing and feeling and allowing all of the feminine energy around you to be part of your healing, part of your inspiration, and therefore part of serving you so you can offer your deepest gifts. So as a masculine man, how do you interact with all the feminine energy you feel all day in all of its different forms so that your gifts are liberated, so that you give from your soul, from your heart, ever more deeply, rather than getting distracted by the feminine energy. The secret or the key to this is to realize that you can merge with feminine energy completely without any physical merging. You don't even need to look at a woman in order to feel her energy, receive her, be inspired, and gift the world from your inspiration that she has provided to you. 
So the best way of working with feminine energy, with different women that you meet throughout the day and are attracted to, is by converting your arousal into inspiration and allowing that inspiration to connect with your deepest purpose. And so you offer your deepest gift to the world being inspired by the feminine form. Of course, you also want that inspiration in your chosen intimate relationship, which means your chosen intimate partner can, over time, learn to give the full spectrum of feminine energy. She can be the tiger. She could be the hurricane. She could be the innocent. She could be the pond. She can be the rainstorm. She could be the sunshine. She could be the full spectrum for you. Or perhaps the two of you prefer that you receive certain flavors of feminine energy in other ways. You can receive feminine energy through nature directly, through walking in the woods, through swimming in the ocean, through mountain climbing, skiing, fishing. You can receive feminine energy through music, through beer, through dance. You can receive feminine energy through any form that conveys life force. So by understanding this, you can get the feminine energy you need in your life without jeopardizing your committed relationship. Committed relationships are based on mutual service. I want to serve you. Your partner wants to serve you back. That mutual service, that commitment to serve each other's openness, depth, to bring each other's gifts, to help each other's lives bloom fully is the basis of a committed intimacy. Within that committed intimacy, you could learn the yoga or practice or art of sexuality. How do you play the masculine feminine dynamic within your committed intimacy so that you are both healed and inspired and deepened? And then you realize outside of that intimacy, you're sexually attracted all day to various forms of feminine energy. By learning how to combine yourself with various forms of feminine energy without doing anything that jeopardizes your relationship, without doing anything that nullifies your commitment, enables you to both heal and grow and remain in a committed relationship. So you are always attracted to merge with specific qualities of feminine energy that are lacking in your life and in your own body. That desire to merge fuels your sexual desire. And by understanding that that sexual desire is an innocent, spontaneous, and natural response between masculine and feminine poles, you no longer take it so personally. You no longer think that you actually have to do something with a woman personally. And you realize it is an endless mutual gifting of masculine and feminine. Some is within a committed intimacy, so you can take that as far as you want. Some is outside of a committed intimacy. And you need to decide how responsible are you willing to be for the outcomes of your behaviors. Every man is free to choose how he wants to play this, how he will find his range and spectrum of feminine energy that he needs to be inspired to give his deepest gift. By understanding this, we can give our deepest gift. We can keep our committed relationships sacred. We can exchange the energies we need to outside of that committed relationship in clean ways that only inspire all the participants to give of their hearts most deeply. And we could minimize confusion. Because the feminine is energy, is life force, is the motion of love, is light dancing, the feminine is simultaneously the most attractive thing there is for the masculine and the most confusing, chaotic, and sometimes repulsive. When you want the refrigerator to have just one picture on it, the feminine partner of yours may want hundreds of photos on the refrigerator. You may want the furniture ordered a certain way in your room so you can easily get from one place to another. But your feminine partner may have a different sense of beauty, a different sense of fullness than you do. She may furnish the home very different than you would choose. So what do you do? 
Here you've chosen this woman for her fullness, for her spontaneity, for her qualities of energy, for her light, for the way her love shines through her eyes and her body. And at the same time, when she wants to shine that light through her furniture or the way she wants to fill your space, you say no. It's very important to feel what is your deepest purpose. How do you need to live so you can die complete? What are you willing to be responsible for? And outside of that domain of responsibility, outside of your deepest purpose, if you allow your chosen woman to manifest beauty, to manifest light in her way, you'll probably learn a lot. There may be areas in your life where the two of you disagree and you need to talk about these areas, maybe have a third person help you, help you mediate the process so you could come up with something you can both agree with as partners. But much more often than that, the little things don't make a whole lot of difference. And it's better to let her deal with the things that are very important to her and you deal with what is very important to you and get feedback from each other. But realize that the exact same woman who turns you on most sexually will be the same woman who most turns you off in the rest of your life. Because when you're in your masculine and you're trying to get something done, you're not doing the lovemaking, you're not uniting with your woman in depth and merger, but you're trying to complete a task then her feminine energy might seem like an obstruction to you completing a task. She may want to talk about something when you don't, or she may want to arrange the house in ways that don't serve your task. What do you do? Why is it that the women you find most sexually attractive are the most difficult to live with? The woman who you most want to merge with heart to heart and sexually is also the woman who frustrates you the most, who doesn't speak with you in ways you could understand, or what you do understand doesn't seem to be what she means. And this is the way it always is. I've been told that in Chinese that the characters for sex stand for something like flowery combat. We can look at the relationship between the masculine and feminine in intimacy as a kind of playful opposition, a pleasurable opposition, something like dancing together where you're cooperating with each other, but you're also adding a little that you have to keep up with. That kind of play, that kind of flowery combat or pleasurable opposition is the nature of the masculine and feminine in relationship. If you lose connection to your deepest heart's purpose, then you are easily swayed by the feminine. You're drawn into her domain of all kinds of options and possibilities. But if you stay connected to your heart, everything your partner says and does is felt from the place of your deepest source. If she's talking about something that happened to her during the day and that doesn't deepen you or deepen her or allow your love to be given to the world more fully or bring more light into your intimacy, into your household and into the world, then why would you want to listen to her talk about what she's talking about? There are times to say, this is what we need to do right now because my deepest heart feels this and I need you to trust my deepest heart. That's why we're together. There are also times when it's good to put aside your own feelings and feel what she's saying, what she's indicating. But always remember that the same qualities you find most attractive sexually are the qualities that will make you not trust your partner outside of the sexual domain. Her spontaneousness during sex will become her lack of ability to carry through during the day. The way that she just surprises you with ever fresh expressions of love and devotion during sex will be the way she surprises you during the day by not showing up an appointment that she committed to or by doing something she expressly told you she wouldn't. The flow of the feminine that is most attractive to merge with in sexual moments becomes, for many men, a real pain in the ass outside of the sexual domain. Now, some men simply separate the two. They no longer are sexually attracted to their intimate partner. 
They treat their intimate partner as more of a life partner. They take care of the kids together. They take care of the house together. They might earn a living and combine themselves financially. But if in addition to that, they want a sexual polarity between them, then they need to understand the laws of polarity. And in specific, you as a man need to understand that the qualities that turn you on sexually are not necessarily the same qualities that lead to trust in your daily life together. So you need to decide, why are you together with your woman? There are, of course, many reasons because we're multidimensional beings. You may have chosen your woman to be with her sexually, you may have chosen your woman in order to raise children. You may have chosen your woman to combine your finances together. But unless you decide on what your priority is, the relationship becomes mushy. All of these various reasons to be together become blended together and neutralized and made bland and homogenous. So the sexual domain is never fully expressed and the creative domain is never fully expressed. What your children need is often not what the two of you need sexually, which is often not what the two of you need financially. So it's very important to decide on your single most important reason for being together with your partner. For instance, you may choose your children, that you're together for the sake of your children. In that case, you subordinate your sexual desires to the needs of your children. You subordinate your financial plans to the needs of your children. You do whatever you need to because your priority is your children. So it's very important to choose your priority in intimacy and then organize all your other aspects of intimacy, and there are of course many, around that priority. Now once you do that, how do you deal with your sexual desire? How do you deal with the fact that to be sexually attracted to your woman, you want her to be one way? And then outside of the bed, in order to trust that she could balance the checkbook, you need her to be another way. Well, to sort all of that out, you need to decide, one, what is your deepest purpose in life that includes your relationship? Two, what is the purpose of the relationship itself? Again, there are many different reasons for being together, but what's the most single important reason for being together? So you can prioritize that and organize and align the rest of the relationship around that. And then finally, understand that you will always be in playful opposition with the qualities you are attracted to sexually. You will fight with the very same qualities that you want to dive into sexually. You will fight with those qualities through the day. So the way it is, the state of affairs is, the woman who most turns you on sexually is often the woman that most frustrates you for the rest of the day. And if you do find a woman who you work with well as a partner all through the day, you may find that you're not as sexually attracted to them in the moments of intimacy. So it's very important to decide on how do you want to live your sexuality and where does your sexual expression rank in your hierarchy of priorities? Is it what is most important in your intimacy? Or are other things more important in your intimacy? Most men will sacrifice their job, their family, and as we've seen in a recent presidential scandal, they will sacrifice their country for the sake of the sexual transmission of energy. The desire, the need to merge with the feminine is so intense for most men that they'll risk all kinds of things that are very important in their life for even a brief moment of complete sexual merger. The first stage approach to this is to be selfish. And if you need sex, you have it however you need it. You go to a prostitute or have a mistress. In the second stage, we learn to cooperate we usually suppress the part of ourselves that finds that sexual merger so inspiring. And so we become uninspired monogamists. But in the third stage, we feel our deepest purpose and we feel how does sex add to or subtract from our expression of our deepest purpose. And then we can 
yogically or artfully arrange our sexuality so that it serves our deepest purpose, the deepest purpose of our partner, of our family, of our community, and of our Earth's community. Once we understand those priorities, we could begin approaching specifically the sexual practices that we need so that all of us continue growing. Know your deepest purpose, know the single most important purpose of your relationship, and understand that the same qualities you find sexually attractive will most frustrate you, and you're on your way to being able to give your gift as a superior man in intimacy. You are probably attracted to many women every day. Every woman who offers you a quality of feminine energy, a part of the feminine rainbow that you need in the moment or that would heal you, feels amazing and fantastic, really inspirational. A woman's smile can literally light up your entire day. So how do you deal with all of this? How do you deal with the constant attraction you feel all through the day to different qualities of feminine energy? Well, you need to know why are you here? What is your heart's deepest impulse? Without knowing your heart's deepest impulse, then all you have is a bunch of superficial impulses that are always conflictual. Your babysitter is taking care of your children, but you're sexually attracted to your babysitter. But if you have sex with your babysitter, you'll end up divorced and you really love your wife but you don't have good sex with your wife, so she should understand if you have sex with your babysitter, but you'll probably ruin your babysitter's life also if you have sex with her. So what do you do? So there's infinite complexity and always opposing thoughts in your own mind. Again, by knowing your deepest purpose, by ongoingly staying continuously connected with your heart's most profound openness, your heart's most vulnerable feeling sensitivity, then you can organize your random desires throughout the day to serve that deepest purpose. In other words, if you're walking down the street and there are beautiful women all around you, as there always are, if you know your deepest purpose, then the energy, the arousal that you feel by being blessed by witnessing this beauty can be used to give your gift. Your inspiration can be offered through the giving of your gift. So every woman you see through the day, every woman who makes you happy to be alive, contributes to the giving of your gift to the world. But if you do not know your deepest purpose, if you're just moving through the day for lesser reasons based on your fears and tensions and your need to release stress, then when you partake of beauty, then when you breathe in and feel the feminine divine in all of these women, then when you become aroused and happy to be alive by the force of the feminine, you'll want to get rid of it. You'll be stimulated and want to release it. You'll be stimulated all day and you'll have masturbatory fantasies of these women. You'll be stimulated and you'll want to go home and just release it and go to bed. You'll want to combine with all of those women. There's no reason not to. What do you do with all that energy? You'll schmooze. You'll find yourself flirting. You'll be standing in line at a grocery store next to an attractive woman, and she turns to you, and you, you lose your breath. She's so breathtakingly beautiful. And then your mind will be reeling with that energy, and you'll wonder, should I ask her out, or am I in a relationship, or maybe I'm not in a committed relationship. All the conflicts in your own mind will come to the fore. But if you feel, what is my deepest purpose? What is my gift in this moment? You can feel, how does this woman's blessing of my life, how does this woman's depth of wisdom and radiance that she's shining through her eyes or the way she moves or the way she smiles, how can I allow that to inspire my deepest gift so that I can offer it more fully to her, to the world, to my chosen intimate partner, to my family? So it's essential to understand your deepest desire so that you could subordinate your lesser desires to your most profound desire. True discipline does not involve suppression. True discipline 
does not involve resisting your desire to merge with all the feminine forms you feel and see all day. True discipline means to act on your deepest impulse rather than your more superficial motivations. Discipline is the capacity to act from your deepest motive as opposed to your lesser motives. And so in every sexual moment, the question is, how can the sexual exchange between masculine and feminine, this polarization, be used to serve all beings, be used to serve the world, be used to offer the gift I am here to give? How can that inspiration be used to deepen my family life, my intimate life with my chosen partner? And then the blessing, the radiance, the awesome awakening power of the feminine that is all around you all the time in nature, but most especially in other human women, that constant blessing force becomes converted into the fuel of inspiration for your deepest love gift to all of those in your life, as opposed to merely being a pebble in a pond with no organizing principle. So as every pebble gets thrown in, the waves that are formed just start making a mess on the surface of the pond. Instead of that, if you know your purpose, all of those waves are navigated like a ship on the ocean, and you reach your destination being moved by the currents of the ocean and the wind, because you know where you're going and you know how to harness that energy. Whereas if you don't, that energy, that desire is just motion, and you will begin to leak your energy to these women in subtle flirting ways. And by doing that, you are training your body to exchange sexual energy, but not all the way. Well, my coworker is very attractive at the office, but I'm not going to have sex with her, but I'll flirt with her a little bit. So you spend all day kind of having sex with her, flirting, energetic exchange of masculine and feminine energy, but you're not going to go all the way. You're not in a committed relationship. You're not even going to kiss. So you're training your body to shut down even while you exchange sexual energies. And frequently in our workplace, especially where there are second stage men and women, they're constantly shutting down their body's sexual response in order to work with their coworkers they're highly attracted to. And over time, over months and years of doing that, we learn to both shut down and partially exchange sexual energy rather than fully appreciate and exchange sexual energy always for the sake of bringing light and consciousness to the world, never violating our commitments, and always giving our deepest heart through the inspiration that the feminine gives us. Because the masculine identifies with consciousness, the masculine is always seeking perfection. Consciousness is perfection. It is as it is, always. Nothing needs to be done. Nothing needs to be changed. Consciousness is. Because of that, Anyone identified with their masculine is always attempting in some subtle way to make perfect the feminine, to make perfect the world, the relationship, sex, money, career. Perfection is never reached because the only thing that is perfect in the sense of unchanging and unneeding to be changed is consciousness itself. So it's a misplaced identification with consciousness onto the forms of consciousness, the dancing light of consciousness, which is always changing and never perfect. Never perfect. 
Because of this, the masculine is always wondering, is there a better relationship for me around the corner? Am I better off with a different woman? Am I better off with no committed relationship, but instead playing the field, having different girlfriends? Should I have a wife and a mistress? Or should I keep all of my sexual desires within a committed intimacy? Do I even love her? Am I willing to not have sex with anyone else ever, even though I love her? So men ask themselves these kinds of questions. And because the mind is always fractured and in opposition with itself, with one inner voice conflicting with another inner voice, one of your inner voices, for instance, wanting deep and long-term intimacy, another inner voice wanting the freedom to have sex with new people over time, because we have these conflicting inner voices, the only way to resolve our inner conflicts is to find our most singular, deepest desire. That is, once again, our deepest purpose, our most profound heart motive. Through our meditative process or our contemplative process, through our discussions with our friends and our partners, we could become more and more attuned to that deep purpose, the expression of which changes over time, but the source of which never changes. If and when, in the present moment, we can rest in our deepest heart source, our deepest motive, it becomes quite easy to make decisions about commitment and sex. Would a committed intimacy serve your capacity to bring light to the world? Or would a committed intimacy detract and distract you from bringing light into the world? Would having sex with a number of partners more serve your capacity to offer your deepest purpose to the world? Or would having sex with only one person most serve your capacity to offer your deepest gift to the world. So in any moment when you are continuous with your depth, in any moment that you can feel your heart's deepest yearning to give your love to the world through your loving, your art, your relationships, through everything you create, in those moments of continuousness with your heart depth, you can always decide, should I have sex now or not? Should I have sex with her or not with her? Should I choose to be in a committed intimacy that is monogamous? Should I choose to be in a different kind of intimacy? Those questions can now be answered because the test is easy. Does being promiscuous serve the offering of my gift? Does being monogamous serve the offering of my gift? What serves your deepest offering? And that is the answer to the question of who and how many you should choose as sexual partners or as partners in committed intimacy. It is not true that everything works for everybody. For some people, committed intimacy is the only way to get into their deep heart so that their deepest gifts can spring forward. For other people, they need several intimacies simultaneously in order to create a kind of dynamic in their life from which their gifts spring. And of course, feeling into your partner's lives also informs your choices because you only want to serve your partner's heart. So you can also ask, does being with multiple partners serve their hearts? Or does being with one partner serve her heart more? So in order to make a decision, as always, you pick your priority, what is most fundamental, most important to you, and make your choices organized around that, who to be with, how to be with them, how many to be with. If you choose a committed intimacy, it is important to understand that the woman you choose 
does not want to be number one in your life. She may, of course, want to be the most important human in your life, but she does not want to be the most important anything in your life. She knows that one day she will die. She knows that the relationship may or may not last. She knows that if you hide your deepest purpose, or if you curtail your deepest life impulse in order to please her, in order to make her feel like she's number one in life, you will also resent her because you will have given up your deepest impulse to make her feel like she's the only reason that you're alive. There's a big difference between her being the light of your life, the inspiration of your heart, the source of your heart arousal, the way your soul connects to the world and is attracted into the world. There's a difference between a woman offering you those blessings and a woman who you cannot live without. If you cannot live without her, if you are dependent on her, if you can only continue when she's giving you love and you collapse when she does not, if you could only continue giving your gift while she's in your life and you will cease giving your gift if she is not in your life, she can feel that weakness in you. She doesn't want you to require her to be a certain way in order for you to give your gift. She doesn't want you to require her to be in your life or else you can't go on. She doesn't want a little baby that's dependent on her. She wants a man who is fully giving his gift to the world and to her and embraces her in his giving, embraces her completely in his chosen purpose. She is part of his purpose, but she is not all of it. She doesn't want to be smothered by his need for her to be there and for her to be a certain way. In fact, she doesn't want him to depend on her at all. She wants to feel a free man, a man who loves her, a man who chooses her above all other feminine sources, a man who chooses her as the treasure of his life that brings light to his entire life, but who would continue giving his gift completely, even if she disappeared tomorrow. A man who is happy with her and happy without her, but chooses her forcefully, passionately, but equally forcefully and passionately can continue giving their gift to the world with or without her. Such a man she can trust. She can trust his heart isn't bending to her needs, but rather offering his love without curtail. He is not holding back in ordering to keep her with him. He's not holding back in order not to scare her away. He's a living gift, embracing her, feeling her, loving her, knowing her deepest heart. And yet, if she leaves, he can continue fully. If she dies, his heart will grieve, his heart will ache. For days or months or years, his heart may feel intense pain and suffering and hurt. But in the midst of that intense pain and suffering and hurt, he still has full access to the source of his being, to the love that moves his life, with her or without her and she can trust that in him. So don't make her the only thing in your life or the most important thing in your life. Embrace her as the human you choose to live with most intimately. Embrace her as the treasure, the gold in your life that shines and gives you the value of life itself. The attractive force that when you wake up in the morning makes you happy to be alive as you see her sleeping next to you. At the dinner table when she smiles and your heart expands. 
when she looks into your eyes and through all your busyness and your goals and tensions, in her eyes you feel a depth of devotion that awes you, that brings you to your knees so that you too can worship the divine because you can feel the devotion she has to love in her eyes. Ultimately, when a woman feels your heart, she wants to feel the heart of God. At your depth, she wants to feel the depth of God. She wants to feel divinity itself motivating your life and motivating your desire to be with her. She wants to feel loved and taken by God when she is loved and taken by you. Therefore, God, or the divine, or the deepest impulse of your heart, is what is most important to both you and her. She doesn't want to be the only thing in your life. And so, if you continue to come after her, if you meet a woman and you continue to want to be with her, even though she is not feeling your purpose in your heart, even though she is not feeling the divine in your heart, and you still come after her, you are basically saying, well, I live on superficial desires. Sure, I want you. You're very beautiful and sweet. I would love to be with you. I'm lost in my life. I don't know where I'm going. You won't feel God in my heart. You won't feel my deepest impulse in my heart. You'll feel my superficial desires, but that should be good enough. Such a woman will not choose you. She won't want to choose you because she only feels you wanting her instead of feeling your love for God, your love for allowing God's will to come through your life, your commitment to bringing love and light to the world and her being part of that. She doesn't want to be the only thing in your life. She doesn't want to be number one in your life. And therefore, choose to be with a partner who chooses to be with you. If you continue to run after a woman and dissociate from your deepest source, your deepest purpose, she will feel your own detachment, your own disconnect from your heart, from the divine. So she will not feel the divine embracing her when you embrace her. And yet that is her deepest desire. Her deepest desire is to feel the inexpressible divine. It's beyond words. It's that which is living all of us. It's the motivation at every heart. She wants to feel taken by that immense force of being, by that infinite, eternal openness. She wants to feel pressed down by the infinite mass of being that is masculine divinity. She wants to feel pinned by that, taken by that, smushed by that, weighted down by that. She doesn't want to feel pushed and weighted down by your superficial desires. And so there comes a point in your pursuit of a woman when you must evidence your deepest desire. It is not her. So this isn't a matter of playing hard to get, but it is a matter of simply demonstrating your deepest commitment. I love you, but I love God more than chasing after you. So if you want to be with me, I am here. I love you and I will commit myself to being with you and serving you in the name of God as an expression of our deepest love. I will give you all of that, and I will want from you all of that. But if that's not what you're interested in, I have no interest in you. That is what she wants from you. She wants your deepest desire, which may include her. But if you chase after her when she is not feeling your deepest purpose, when she is not feeling the divine in your heart, then you're simply imposing your superficial desires on her rather than offering her the gift of your divinity through your heart and body. So not only does she not want to be the only thing in your life, she also doesn't want to feel 
that she's more important to you than God is. She doesn't want to feel that you will ignore your heart's impulse. She doesn't want to feel that you will stop searching for your deepest expression of love because you've become so infatuated with chasing after her. She wants to know you love her. She wants to know you deeply desire her. She wants to know you want to ravish her, take her, open her, reach into the deepest caverns of her heart and bloom them open in ways she's never even felt before. But you can only do that if she trusts you enough to open with you. And she'll only trust you enough to open with you if she feels that you love God and you love her as part of your divine love. Most of us make the same mistake. We think everybody else is just like we are. One of the ways that the masculine is very different from the feminine is that the masculine lives in a kind of grid of space and time. So for a woman or a man who is in their masculine, when they say, I will meet you on 45th Street at 5 o'clock, it's a certain place in time that's agreed upon, and you need to make plans to be able to get there, both in space and in time. So the masculine is always holding a kind of grid of reality in his mind of what people said and what they've committed to and what they've done and how that stretches out in space and time. But the feminine in men and women is simply the flow of what is happening for real right now. It does not matter if it's been sunny for 30 days, if on the 31st day there's a tsunami or a hurricane or a rainstorm, the previous 30 days of sunshine mean nothing. Suddenly everything is soaked. All that matters is that it's raining now. Now to the masculine, outside of life, observing life, witnessing all of that which changes, the masculine can feel, hmm, it was sunny for 30 days, then it rained for one day. My guess is it will be sunny for another 30 days. So the masculine can abstract itself out and make generalizations, and therefore the masculine can forgive mistakes. The masculine can say, Hmm, that person has been on time for 20 years. They have never missed a meeting. And they just missed a meeting. Must have been an accident, because that's a trustable person. They've never missed a meeting until now. That, however, is not how the feminine works. The feminine is that 31st day when it's raining. If you, as a man in a committed intimacy, have made a promise to your woman, and you break that promise, she is not trusting you now. She feels in her body now that you said one thing and did another, and right now in her body she cannot find trust for you. It does not matter that if in the previous year or ten years you had always done what you said you would do, your track record is meaningless to her if she is in her feminine. Now, if you are asking your intimate partner to move into her masculine, then she can, of course, like you, reside back in consciousness and feel out there in life and say, like you, hmm, well, I am hurt and in the moment I can't trust you, Thinking about this rationally, you've always been on time. You've always said you would do what you did and followed through with it. So I should trust you, even though my body doesn't trust you right now and I don't want you having sex with me right now. I know that will pass because I know that for most of our years together, you've done everything you said you'd do. Of course, that's what most men wish their women partners would say. But to do that, she has to move into her masculine. So now you're in your masculine, she's in her masculine. The feeling is like two masculine friends together. Of course, you could share deep love, but there's no polarity there. There's no sexually passionate attraction there. If she remains in her feminine, 
which means you can enjoy sexual passion, sexual polarity with her. So you can rest in your masculine, she can rest in her feminine. By definition, that means your track record is meaningless to her. The fact that for 30 years you've kept your word doesn't mean anything if in this moment you have not. If she is in her feminine, and if in this moment you have not kept your word, her heart is crushed, her body is turned off, she looks at you and cannot trust your guidance because you just lied to her. Never mind that you've never mistaken before. You've always done what you said you've done before. So one of the sources of frustration and intimacy is when the more masculine identified partner expects the more feminine identified partner to be like him. Again, we all do this. We all assume everyone is like us. But one way that the feminine is not like the masculine is that your track record, however good it is, doesn't mean anything to her. Right now, if you're not aligned with what you said, if your actions aren't aligned with your words, and if your actions and words aren't aligned with your deepest heart impulse, she feels it right now in this present moment and cannot trust you right now. And the time and space grid that you're holding when you say, but, 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 for 20 years I've done everything just right, is meaningless to her. She does not hold that grid in her feminine. She does in her masculine, and you need to ask yourself, would you prefer that she relate to you from her masculine so she is not sexually attracted to you, but she realizes that you've done the right thing most of the time? Or would you rather experience a deep passion of polarity between the two of you and just know that moment by moment she is always reflecting your integrity to you in the moment? You could be perfectly right on for year after year, and then you suddenly lose integrity and she reflects it to you in that moment. She doesn't trust you as much. Yes, it's a pain in the butt, but it is what you want. In the way of the superior man, you want a woman who instantaneously reflects to you your depth of integrity so that you can then error correct. You can feel deeper into your heart when it looks like she's not trusting you. And then she can respond to that depth in your being being expressed through your life. And when she shows you she trusts you, you know you're more aligned. Of course, there'll be times, as we've discussed, when she might just be testing how clear you are in your purpose. She might be testing you by pushing you a little bit, by teasing you a little bit, by seeing if she could knock you off purpose or distract you. And then she finds pleasure in the fact that she cannot distract you from your depth. But your track record, your history, the grid in space and time that you as a masculine person hold is not held by the feminine. So if you want to embrace the feminine, it means embracing a being who is in the moment reflecting to you not just what you're doing, but everything in her experience, everything, not including the grid of space and time that you are holding. You have a track record in your mind, but to the feminine, there is no track record. There is simply the flow of integrity that you're expressing now or not. If your woman is relaxed in her feminine, she is responding to you spontaneously in the moment. Right now, in this moment, she's showing you her feelings in this moment in response to you. It doesn't have anything to do with your track record of the last 20 years. It's only this moment. So if you make a mistake, and of course, everyone makes mistakes, Perhaps we could look at life as a man as one long mistake that we're constantly learning from. But since we're always making mistakes, 
we're always seeing that look in our partner's face when we're hurting her because she can feel when we're not living from our deepest source. She can feel when we're lying to ourselves. She can feel when we're bending our true heart's impulse for the sake of our own fear or even for her fear. But because her response is spontaneous and not based on a grid of space and time, it means that in the very next moment, after making a mistake, she just wants to feel you deep, present, feeling her, offering your deepest heart to her deepest heart. She doesn't need to hear you go on and on about how you're going to fix yourself. That space and time grid doesn't really matter to her feminine. She doesn't need to feel you collapsed into your own weakness and endlessly apologizing for how you'll do better next time and how you're sorry for hurting her. If you know you've hurt her, if you've made a mistake, you may simply acknowledge that you've made a mistake. I've messed up. But then the very next moment, show that you have error corrected. Show that now you've fallen down, you've stood up, dusted yourself off, and you're taking the next step, taking into account what you have learned from your mistake. Every mistake is a learning. So your woman can feel your constant learning parallel with what seems to you to be your constant mistakes. One of the secrets for offering your depth to a woman is not to linger in time, but in the moment, present moment, to simply offer your deepest love to her so her heart opens. If she is closed down and concerned because you've done something stupid, you've seen what you've done, you've corrected what you've done, but she's still concerned, perhaps it's more important to embrace her or to give her a loving spanking with a smile or to tickle her or to stand up and put on some music and dance for two minutes with her. Sometimes you can open her body through touch. Sometimes you can open her heart through humor. Sometimes you can access her soul through your gaze in this present moment, no matter how bad your error was a few minutes ago. So one of the things that women really want from you as a man in intimate partnership is your capacity to simply recognize you've made a mistake and without collapsing, you might offer a brief apology or not. But what's most important is that you've taken into account the error that you've made, you've corrected it, you've embraced her, and you're moving on. You simply show her your depth now. You embrace her in love now. You don't take your own psychological process and make her deal with it. She is not your therapist. She is not your men's group leader trying to help you man to man or masculine to masculine. She is the water and you have touched the water and the water ripples. She is responding with intense sensitivity and deep wisdom to your subtle errors that you may not even notice but she responds just as deeply to your sudden offerings of depth and love. In every present moment, you have an opportunity to open your woman's heart or to close it. In a first stage moment, you need to take care of your own needs first. In a second stage moment, you're trying to be nice and create a kind of sharing mutual respect and cooperation. But in a third stage moment, you are feeling her heart and doing what you can to serve her heart's bloom, for her heart to open, to receive your presence deeply into her heart and body. What would you need to do right now to help your woman feel the divinity in her heart? her deepest devotion to God, her deepest devotion, her commitment to love. How can you help your woman feel that so she too, like you, can give love and her life from her deepest heart? It is not very often that talking about your problems helps her heart deepen and offer her gift. Sometimes, of course, it's fine to discuss your problems with your intimate partner. 
but for a regular rule, always feel that this moment is an opportunity to learn from the response of your feminine partner and in the very next present now moment to offer your deepest love and gift through touch, through movement, through humor, through connection. The feminine lives in the domain of energy, whereas the masculine lives in the domain of attention. So the masculine is often wondering, where do we put our attention? Toward what goal do we orient ourselves? So man to man, perhaps me speaking to you, I often would suggest feel your deepest purpose and align your actions with that deepest purpose. But that is not what the feminine is feeling. The feminine is love. The feminine wants to receive love and the feminine wants to give love. The feminine is the movement of love itself. Your service of the feminine is always to liberate any traps around the feminine so that she can bloom freely in her loving. And that requires your loving in the moment. One of the masculine's weaknesses is to dissociate from relationship in the pursuit of a goal. And one of the feminine's strengths is to only be in the flow of relationship and to reflect that love or its lack rather than being lost in future goals. So embrace her response as a gift and immediately offer her your gift in the domain of energy, not the domain of attention. That means rather than directing your woman's mind to attend to certain facts, that is sometimes important, but rather than orienting her mind to attend to certain facts or events, allow her body and heart to feel the energy of love transmitted through your bodies. It could be as simple as a touch of her hand looking into her eyes, the tone of your voice, perhaps a gentle embrace, perhaps a sudden and passionate embrace. The question is, how do you communicate love through energy? That's not the question between the masculine and masculine, between man and man. If I look into your eyes as a man and touch you and communicate love to you, you may say, thanks, man, I feel your love. But what are we going to do? You want to make a decision. So for men to feel they've communicated their love completely, there needs to be a resolution with a decision. Hey, brother, we're going to do this. That sounds right. Let's do it together. But the feminine isn't attending to options. The masculine within your partner is attending to options just like you are, trying to decide what to do. But the feminine in your partner is feeling, is love flowing? Or is love not flowing? That's a different kind of feeling than, am I aligning my present and future actions with my purpose or not? That's your business. That's the business of her masculine also. But the business of her feminine is devotion. Is love flowing or not? Your communication to your intimate partner to the feminine core of your intimate partner is an energetic communication. Your integrity is communicated to her, not through saying what you're going to do, not through talking about your philosophies or your spiritual theories, not through describing your visions and your life, but through in the moment transmitting love through energy. Energy is conducting love through you to her. The energy, again, of touch, the energy of sound of your voice. Singing a song of love to her in a tone of voice that communicates deep love means a lot more to her than making all kinds of promises about what you'll do in the future because you love her. She needs and wants to feel love communicated through energy, not through the reorientation of attention which is the masculine's preferred way of moving forward in love. So one of the keys then for working with the feminine, for touching your intimate partner in a way that truly communicates love, is remembering 
that she receives love through energy, not through orienting her attention. Once you have developed a capacity for the present moment feeling connection to your deep heart, then you can error correct. Then you can feel my deepest purpose is served in this moment by spending time with my chosen woman. Or you can feel, no, my deepest purpose is not served. It's inhibited. I'm distracted. So in this moment, I need to discipline myself, tell my partner I need another hour by myself to finish my project and focus on that. So once you know your deepest purpose and can stay continuous to that, which is an always in the present moment rediscovery, fresh every moment, freshly sourced in every moment in your deepest heart. So you're guiding your life fresh every moment. Once you're doing that, you can error correct in your relationship. But what do you do if you really don't know what serves your deepest purpose? For instance, you may know that in this moment, your deepest purpose is to finish writing a business plan, for instance. Well, how do you know if taking a break in this moment will serve you completing the business plan? Or if continuing working will serve the business plan being completed? How do you know if making love with your woman for an hour tonight will enable you to give your deepest gifts? Or if being celibate for a week will enable you to give your deepest gifts. Sometimes, even though you know your deepest purpose, you really don't know how the outcome of various actions will affect your purpose. That's why we have to be willing to make mistakes and learn from them. In some ways, the life of the superior man really does feel like one ongoing mistake and then one ongoing error correction. And what women want to feel, what your intimate partner wants to feel, is she wants to be able to trust that you have the courage to make mistakes, know you've made a mistake, and instantly correct your error. Of course, making a new mistake the next moment, correcting again, making a new mistake the next moment. So if we're afraid to make mistakes, our partners feel that fear and don't trust us. It's important that we're willing to risk making mistakes because it's that way where we find our true purpose lived in the world. There is no way to know in advance how certain things will affect your capacity to give your gift to the world. Sometimes you just have to risk it and try it. But if you're sensitive, you can usually feel quite soon if your decision is good. Is my purpose being served or not being served by this action? Should I be with two women or one woman or celibate? Sometimes you have to try it to know the real answer, but you don't have to try it for long. The discovery is always in the present moment. So as soon as you realize you've made a mistake in the present moment, you simply change the decision with clarity Take care of any mistakes you've made, mend any hurts you've created, and continue giving your gift, living and loving. So your woman can now feel you're willing to take the risk, live as one long mistake, and therefore create art out of every moment of mistakes. Art is the spontaneous making of beauty out of an ongoing mistake that is your life, and that is the way of the superior man. The Way of the Superior Man
Now, in the darker sides, in the way we all seek freedom, they become more violent, more aggressive. That's why I call them darker. They're certainly not worse. They're simply where a real root of energy lies. So some ways of seeking freedom that we can consider toward the darker side of the spectrum is through killing or war. Again, most wars are fought in the name of freedom, and they're fought by literally making a killing. So when we approach war, it is often the masculine desire to be free, politically free, free for religious expression. You might want to expand the boundaries of your country and so have greater freedom within your country or freedom of speech or freedom for women to vote. So most of politics and war in particular is about desiring more freedom. But so are things like martial arts or the capacity to fight. When confronted by constraints, the masculine could become very trapped. For instance, a man who comes home from work, he's been working all day, he might be exhausted. And here comes the dog rubbing on his leg. And here comes his four children asking for attention. And his wife walks in with a stack of bills and says, Honey, we have to pay these bills. They've been collecting for weeks. And then the phone rings. And it's a friend of his who's complaining about something he did. And this man just feels trapped, constrained by the responsibilities of life. And that constraint builds up in him. And he may get angry and kick the dog and strike out or maybe even hit his children or his wife or punch a hole in the wall. So that's an example toward the darker side of the spectrum of the masculine seeking freedom from the simple responsibilities of life and striking outward. In this case, you're striking out and trying to be free of the demands put on you by your dog, by your children, by your partner. Now, martial arts are a way of using those same energies of fighting, the ability to combat yourself towards freedom for the sake of love. So even the darker aspects of the masculine scale of seeking freedom can be converted as expressions of love. So when war is only fought for love, that becomes martial arts. When an abusive man is able to take that energy of his desire to break out of constraints into freedom and use it constructively, then he becomes somebody who can ravish his partner and love rather than attack her because he's angry. He becomes somebody who could make very clear demands from his true heart authority of his children, of his co-workers, of his dog even, from a place of love, but strongly and with clarity. So it's important that we enter the dark side of our desire to seek freedom from a place of love, of openness, our motive must be one of liberating light. So, for instance, again, at the darker side of the desire to seek freedom of the masculine is the rapist. Here's a man who feels so constrained that the only way he could feel freedom is by overpowering a victim. If that desire to overpower a victim to feel free is connected to the deep heart then he would look into his partner's eyes and he would feel her deep heart from his. He would feel how her deep heart is yearning to be known, yearning, in fact, to be taken, occasionally yearning to be ravished. And so the impulse, when it's dissociated from the heart, that would possibly become rape or perhaps rape fantasy, when united with the heart desire to open one to freedom, to love, to bliss, becomes ravishment. The rapist impulse becomes the impulse to gift love through ravishment. It involves that dark energy. It could still be pretty rough and tumble, pinning someone's arms down, holding them below you, really taking her. But you're feeling deep into her heart because your heart is so wide open. You feel her soul looking through into her eyes. Every nuance of her breath you feel and are breathing with her. Her toes curl and your toes feel it. Your entire body, cell to cell, is with her merging in deep love. And you are ravishing her, overpowering her with your love. So the darker side of the desire to seek freedom involves things like war, which can be converted to martial arts and abuse, which can be converted to authentic heart command. 
and that desire to rape or ravish, the need to help open the heart, specifically to be with the woman you love, remove all of her tension, pin down her resistance, and enter her heart with your deepest love, your deepest motive. Now, because our culture has not learned to embrace the darker aspects of our seeking freedom with love, we often simply disconnect from our darker aspects. So the desire to really take a woman becomes sublimated and even suppressed and begins to fester underneath. It begins to build up in psychological terms into a demonic force or a pathological force often below your consciousness. So when you're watching TV and you see somebody being abused on TV or you're listening to the news about a serial murderer or a serial rapist or somebody who's been severely tortured, there's a kind of fascination because the pathological or demonic energies within us that have not been connected to love are winding around, wanting to take a woman in this case. And so you see that on TV, you see it in movies, violence towards women, you see it in the news. And what happens is because we're unable to unite our love with our darker desires internally, we must face them externally. So we externalize our desire to ravish and we watch it on TV or in movies or in our gossip of one another. So we tend to externalize and necessitate our entertainment to give us the uniting with our own dark side that would be much better united in our own body and heart. Once we learn to connect with that dark energy within us, our darker desires to give freedom. These are really, truly desires to be free and give freedom. War, as misplaced as that desire is, it is often genuinely an expression to bring freedom to people or to give freedom through killing people. Ravishment is a way of giving freedom to the heart of your lover by pinning her down and taking her. These impulses are alive in us. They are a part of our heritage. They are a part of the spectrum of freedom. To sit by while others are oppressed and not to fight for them. To allow your woman to be tense and closed down without taking her, opening her, and ravishing her heart hurts. And so we begin to feel our own weakness. We are unable to enter the world with strength. We are unable to enter our woman with strength because we've disconnected from our darker, authentic heart desires to bring freedom to ourselves and others. So it takes quite a bit of time for most men to reclaim their so-called dark side. That is, their darker desires to give love and freedom through their body, whether through their work, whether through martial arts, whether through their ravishment of their ladies, whether through their command and a heart authority. In addition, of course, to the way they earn a living, to the way they watch TV, to the way they have sex, to the way they meditate, all of these ways of seeking freedom and enjoying freedom are in the lighter side of the scale of the masculine search. What happens eventually through practice as we've talked about before, is we grow through three stages. So in the first stage, we attempt to gain freedom through all of these means. We feel, if I make enough money, then I will be free. If I have sex enough or the right way or with the right partner, then I'll be free. If I meditate enough or the right way, or if I get transmission from a teacher, then I'll be free. If I learn how to offer authentic heart command and authority, then I'll be free. So that is the first stage. In the second stage, we learn to cooperate with others. So we learn to diminish or withhold our real desires so we can fit into a kind of cooperative harmony with others. Somebody says, wow, I don't want you doing martial arts around here. And you say, okay, I hear you. I'll give you your space. And years of this kind of compromise often disconnects us from our darker desires. Now we're walking around, we're certainly not rapists, but we're also not ravishers. We're certainly not abusive, but we're also unable to offer our clear and strong heart command. So we've lost touch with the full strength of the search for freedom that is in our bodies, minds, and hearts. In the third stage, 
We re-own the entire spectrum of our search for freedom. And instead of seeking for freedom, we realize now that the entire spectrum from meditation to watching TV, having sex, earning a living, ravishing our partner, martial arts, that entire spectrum are ways of offering freedom, not gaining a freedom for yourself. Meditation is a way of giving love to the world and others. Meditation is a way of being what is true, not seeking it. Sex is a way of giving that depth to your partner, not seeking it from the sexual occasion. Money is a way of offering your gift to the world. Money is a form of energy, and by working for money in a correct way, we increase the light of the world. War and martial arts could be ways of bringing love and light to the world, of increasing true freedom in the world, ravishing our love partner, offering authentic heart command and authority with our children and the people we love. All of those are ways of giving our gifts. So in the third stage, the entire spectrum of the masculine search for freedom, dark and light, becomes animated by the desire to give rather than seek. And when that happens, then it becomes incredibly important for men to re-own the darker aspects of their desire for freedom, to really allow them to feel, yeah, sometimes I really want to take my woman. I really want to open her. And she's resistant. And when she resists, I could feel that anger rise in me. Well, there's nothing wrong with that anger as long as that anger is completely connected to your heart. You are angry because you love her and she is self-imposing suffering on herself. She is tense. She is not breathing fully. She is unwilling to look you in your eyes or open with you. And so that makes you angry because you love her, because you can feel how deeply her heart yearns to flow with love. And there's a part of you that wants to give her that freedom to love, that wants to unlock her heart, unlock her body, so she can relax and be with you. To allow yourself to live from that place, to offer your angry and even aggressive energy, but for the sake of love and from your deepest heart, and most importantly, not because you want anything from your woman, but simply because you love her exactly how she is, and love is motivating your impulse to open her, to serve her, to ravish her, to open the world to open everyone, to open through money, to open through meditation. You offer your gifts through all of these means. Once you do connect with your darker aspects and you realize those are ways of giving love, giving freedom, then you will discover that the entire spectrum becomes filled with energy. In other words, if you can't ravish a woman and the world, you probably can't meditate. If you plateau in your meditations, you've probably also plateaued in your ravishment. The capacity to embrace everyone and everything is the same as your capacity to embrace yourself and your own limits. So in the meditative process, when you're feeling your own boundaries, your own limits, your own fears, are you able to muster the darkness energy necessary to simply ravish your boundaries wide open, to jump, to leap, to wrestle, to fight, to relax, whatever one needs to do to express love and freedom through meditation, not seek it. And so even your meditation, even the way you earn a living, watch TV or have sex, all of those activities are constrained by your constraints in your dark side. If you close down your ravishment capacities, if you inhibit your martial art desires, if you hold back your desire to really create freedom in your woman and your world, then you'll hold back throughout the whole spectrum. You will find that you're not able to earn a living in creative ways because you're unable to meet the almost constant, of course, demands and obstructions that the world and people put up in front of you. So if you want the strength to create love and light and freedom in the world and with your lover and in your own practice, then reconnect with your dark side, 
your aggressive desire to create freedom when aggression is necessary in the lovemaking of freedom. Whereas the masculine in all of us is seeking freedom, the feminine in all of us is seeking love. And the feminine seeks love through a full spectrum of means, just like the masculine does. So the feminine in all of us seeks love in the middle of the spectrum through ways of being full. Love is a feeling of fullness, whereas freedom is the feeling of emptiness. And even in religions like Buddhism, it's called emptiness. Love is the feeling of fullness, more life. Whereas freedom involves death, emptiness, removing constraints into freedom. The feminine seeking love wants fullness or more life. So the feminine is always seeking to increase the flow of love and the flow of life. That's why in a conversation between the masculine and the feminine, the masculine is trying to bring the argument or conversation to an end, whereas the feminine has no impulse to bring it to an end. The energy, the flow, the fullness, even if it's angry fullness or sad fullness or chaotic fullness or confused fullness, that's certainly better than nothing. But it is exactly nothing that the masculine is seeking, nothingness. So by understanding what the feminine is doing while you are doing what you are, allows us to help each other rather than act in conflict. So let's take a moment and look at the feminine, the feminine search for love. In the middle of the spectrum, the feminine searches for love through fullness via, for instance, eating. Delicious meals allows the feminine to feel full. Sometimes some chocolate and coffee really does taste like love. And you put that chocolate in your mouth and it melts on your tongue and fills your body and it just feels so good. It, it is love. It's edible love. But there are also other ways that the feminine in all of us seek fullness. Shopping. You're feeling empty, alone perhaps. You go shopping, you go into a store, there are beautiful fabrics and colors, you're touching them, they're full, you try on this, you feel that. You come home with something beautiful you've purchased, you feel great, you feel more love. So shopping allows us to be full, to fill our closets, to fill our lives. If you look at the shoe collection of many people who are identified with the feminine, you'll see there's fullness through the variety of shoes that fill the closet, or fullness on their shelves. Sex is a form of being filled, having your body filled, having your heart filled with affection and emotion. Children, filling a household with children, the sounds of laughter, pets, animals, play, uh, loving conversation. Getting on the phone and talking with your girlfriend is a way of experiencing love and fullness. So telephone conversations, shopping, eating, food, chocolate, those are what the feminine is doing when their masculine partner is masturbating, watching TV, and making money. That is, masculine people who are emphasizing the middle of the spectrum in their search for freedom tend to attract and reinforce the middle of the spectrum in the search of love for the feminine. We could say lighter in the spectrum of the feminine search for love are things like devotional practices, prayer, sacred dance, chanting, uh, puja, meditation, all the forms of allowing your body and heart to be filled with song, communion, the divine through the body, through sacred dance. Then in the darker side, just like the masculine, in the darker side of the feminine search for love, search for fullness, there are things like unwanted pregnancies, high school girls who feel alone and unloved, who purposely become pregnant just to feel the fullness of a baby. It is not the desire to live a full and loving life with a family. It's a kind of dark desire to get pregnant way before you should. It's not necessarily good for you or the baby to get pregnant that early, but still you're doing it so you have the sake of fullness. Or you might play the active victim and elicit abuse from your spouse or from your partner. Because sometimes when your life feels very empty, especially love-wise, relational-wise. If your partner is sitting in front of the TV all the time and is not offering you as a woman any presence at all, your desire for love can become so intense that you're yearning so hard for any kind of fullness that you would just as soon have his angry fullness as nothing. And so you might break his stereo 
just out of your anger. And what do you expect? He's going to embrace you lovingly when you break his stereo? No, you know he's going to be angry, but at least he's going to relate to you. And his anger has more fullness to it than not giving you any energy at all. So at the darker side of the feminine spectrum are things like playing the victim, or it could also be sexual to feel yourself well, we could say the slut or whore to the desire to be filled sexually, promiscuously being filled over and over by many men, fantasies about being taken and ravished. The most common feminine sexual fantasy is to be forced to experience pleasure, to be controlled by the outside, again, to be ravished, taken by the masculine. But lovingly, however, when a woman hasn't been able to experience that lovingly, those desires to be ravished also become psychologically demonic or pathological, and she begins to crave even more violent ways of being taken, things she would never actually want to live out. But she finds herself fantasizing, and if not fantasizing, she's attracted to them again on TV or in movies or entertainment. Just like the masculine, the feminine grows through three stages. So in the first stage, the feminine feels that she can get love through chocolate and shopping and family and sacred dance and sex and being a victim and attracting abuse. And then she grows to the second stage. And in the second stage, she disconnects from those feminine desires. She feels that they're weak. She doesn't want to play the victim. But in doing so, she also gives up her true desires to be ravished by the divine in relationship through a man or through a partner. And so she disconnects from her true yearning to be taken by the divine, filled with light, obliterated in love. She gives up those desires and plays into the middle of the spectrum, maybe the higher ends of the spectrum. So she might do sacred dance while her partner sits in the room and meditates. And then she has some chocolate and talks to her good friends on the phone and maybe does some social events or social goodism, which is another form of fullness to feel as if you're helping society and you're filled with your schedule of various meetings and services and your volunteer work. And your partner, meanwhile, is building co-ops and businesses to serve people. But both of your dark sides are laying dormant. He is not ravishing the woman and the woman is not opening herself to invite that ravishment. But in the third stage, again, she realizes that sacred dance or prayer and devotion, conversation, family, eating, shopping, sex, playing the seductress, playing the victim, are not ways to get love. They are ways to give love. They are art forms, vehicles for creating love, not only in your body and life, but in the body and life of others. How do you prepare food? How do you eat so that everyone becomes more full of love? How do you, in fact, make shopping into a sacred art so that everybody becomes filled with love? The clerks at the store, the other shoppers, your friends you're shopping with. And, most important for our current discussion, how do we enter our darkest desires as desires to give love? How do we play the sacred horror, the sacred slut, sex for the sake of enlightening others, sex for the sake of opening our man's heart to its depth? How do we play the victim? That is, how do we draw from our man his desire to ravish us for the sake of him and us? There is nothing more attractive to the masculine than that dark aspect of the feminine opened devotionally, a slut for God. Nothing more attractive than mutual worship, the masculine worshiping the full spectrum of the feminine divine, the feminine worshiping the full spectrum of the masculine divine. So the killer in the man, now united with love, can face the killer in the woman. In Hindu mythology, they talk about Kali, a goddess who's chopped off men's heads and is holding them because they're not open. That desire in you as a woman, your feminine desire for your partner to access their dark side lovingly, 
arouses your inner Kali, your inner demon. Sometimes you're looking at your man, you know he's not living his fullest, and you feel like chopping his head off. Well, how do you express that? Are you a second stage woman who makes her voice polite and says something like, well, right now I'm feeling some rage and I need to communicate that to you because my perception is that you're not living your life to its fullest and that makes me angry, but I'm responsible for my own anger and you're responsible for you living your life. All of that is true enough in the second stage. Or are you a first stage woman who you feel your man being weak and distant and unable to touch you and so you just get angry and start yelling and screaming, breaking things. So from your first stage need, you just strike. Or maybe you hurt yourself. The first stage feminine often strikes inward, even though it's your man who's not being present with you. But the third stage woman feels her man not being present, perhaps hiding behind his fears. She feels her wrathful energy arise. She feels her desire to chop his head off because she loves him. And from that love, I love you. I want your best. I will not settle for anything less than your best because I love you so much. That Kali-like energy of anger because I love you can become completely expressed in intimacy. And so, if you are identified with the masculine and you want to open your dark side so you can ravish your love partner, then you must expect that the dark side of your love partner will also open. And when that opens, she or he will become both a slut for God, open devotionally, using her body and heart to enchant you into divinity. But she will also be Kali, ready to chop your head off if you are not present if you are not deep, if your heart is not being offered fully. And so if you want to move into your dark side as a man, be ready for your woman to move into hers so that she more and more lovingly chops your head off when you're not being full with her and more and more lovingly enchants your body, minds, and emotion to feel into her and through her to bow in your worship of the Lord, of God, of love, of consciousness, to feel all of it through the awe you feel when she offers you uninhibited, complete surrender. Take me, she says, take me if you dare. And it is that if you dare that separates, let us say, the bimbo from the goddess. She will give you everything. She will receive you. She will take you so deeply into her, you will disappear in the giving. But if you give her less than your heart, she will chop off your head. And so a superior man welcomes that in his chosen partner, welcomes both the Kali head-chopping demoness, heart-connected for sake of love, as well as the most attractive slut in the universe, the entire cosmos, opening to receive your love. Include session five. Our program continues with session six. Feminine Attractiveness with David Data. This concludes Session 5. Our program continues with Session 6. Feminine Attractiveness with David Data. If you are identified with the masculine, then when you totally relax, you rest as consciousness, pure awareness, the reflecting mirror to all that is happening. And all that is happening, everything that moves, everything that changes, is the feminine, is she, dancing, changing, moving. So a man's relationship to all appearance is his relationship to woman. What is that relationship? Well, it varies. In some moments, 
Men are obsessed with whatever appears. They want it. They want her. They want money. They want world peace. They want to get something. And they begin to try to grab it. However, there is no separation between consciousness and appearance. In that deep relaxation, you already are that which appears. There is no need to get it. And so over time, that motive to gain a woman or to gain something in the world begins to relax. And then it moves into the second stage of wanting to work things out with the world, to make peace with the world, to make the world and to make your woman workable. How can we have a workable relationship? How can we cooperate together? How can we create harmony in the world and harmony in the relationship? Sometimes that desire for harmony gets to the point of weakening somebody. The desire for peace is a completely masculine desire. The feminine, volcanoes, hurricanes, all emotions, life and death, birth and destruction. The feminine is not motivated towards peace at all. And so sometimes in the second stage, seeking peace, the masculine feels distracted by the feminine rather than obsessed. The masculine feels, oh, I need to spend more time alone meditating. Oh, I need to create a safe haven, go out in the woods, wear monk's clothes, eat in silence, create a kind of specialized peace with less aggression, less chaos, so we're not so distracted, and we could focus on what's important. And of course, what's important to the masculine is always some form of greater freedom. So again, as we relax, we realize that intense and chaotic emotions, weather, storms, are not other than the deepest consciousness. They are forms dancing in and as consciousness. They are the light of consciousness itself. There is no need to change aggressive actions. There is no need to change the weather pattern, to diminish the weather outside or the weather in your love partner. There is no need to have that new age kind of smile and hugginess and softness because you are not any more afraid of embracing and being everything. And so in the third stage, the superior man does not rest as consciousness separate from the feminine, but rests as consciousness appearing as the feminine, dancing as the world and woman. You already are feeling her from the inside out in the third stage. The feminine then becomes a revelation. In general then, the first stage man becomes obsessed with the feminine, wanting more and more. The second stage man feels somewhat distracted by the feminine, wants time alone to do their work and project and meditation. The third stage man, although certainly they may want the feminine in moments and also want aloneness, non-distraction in moments, at root, the third stage man is practicing the moment-by-moment -moment relaxation and recognition that all of light, every form, is you, is consciousness. There is no separation. It is a revelation of consciousness. All forms, and specifically woman, is a revelation of love, of light, of consciousness. So in the first stage, men desire women who attract their obsessiveness. So feminine attractiveness is in the first stage makes you want her. So a first stage woman puts on makeup and clothing and jewelry in order for you to want her. The second stage woman diminishes her attractiveness so there can be more peace, more harmony, more cooperation. A woman who's dressed a little too sexy kind of stands out in the second stage New Age scene. It looks like, hmm, is she trying to uh, steal my husband? Is she trying to cause trouble? 
So sometimes second-stage women play down the way they dress or adorn their body in order to help create more harmony. A third-stage woman may sometimes dress to attract attention to herself and may sometimes adorn herself in a more diminished way in order to allow more harmony, for instance, in a workplace or in a social situation, all of which is, of course, excellent and good. But a third-stage woman also feels that she is here as a gift of light. So in her chosen intimacy in her life, she allows her full radiance to show, knowing she is completely attractive. And that radiance is more attractive than anything else to her, ma'am. Third stage feminine attractiveness is therefore used to open the man to deeper love. It's not used to attract the man to her. It's not used to create harmony. It's used to open the man. It's used to create inspiration, devotion, and even worship. So feminine attractiveness, all men must acknowledge, rules their life in many ways. Not just the feminine attractiveness of women, but the feminine attractiveness of the world, of more money, of peace. Men become motivated to interact with the feminine for a specific result. Again, we move through being obsessed and then feeling distracted by the feminine and then finally feeling the feminine as a celebration. So, the feminine is all around you. The feminine is what's around you. Everything around you is the feminine. How you respond to everything around you is your responsibility. For instance, if you're with your woman and you've had sex and you've ejaculated, sometimes after that you have very little sexual desire for a period of time. You are depolarized. The polarized attraction between masculine and feminine is neutralized because you've spent yourself, you've decreased your desire. In those moments, you might look at the woman next to you and feel love deeply. So I'm not talking about love diminishing. Love might remain very deep. But your sexual desire, that is, your desire to merge with her energies, is decreased. Of course, the same is true with your desire to merge with the energies of the world. You no longer feel that impulse to dive into, open, and transform her, that is, the world. So over time, as men, as masculine-identified characters, we realize we are responsible for what we do with our desire. We can diminish our desire. We can act on our desire to spend ourselves so we no longer desire, or, in the way of the superior man, we cultivate our desire. So we walk around in a kind of polarized unity with all form, a pleasurable unity of feeling into her at all moments, of merging with her, her meaning not only your chosen intimate partner, but the entire world. How do we keep it up then? How do we remain aroused in our desire to enter and serve the world, especially when we feel battered down, especially when we feel criticized by women or the world, especially when we feel that what we've done has not been received or taken in or used or acknowledged? Again, a first stage man must get something back for what he does, some kind of acknowledgement or pay. A second stage man is willing to offer his gift as long as it doesn't rock the boat too much and he gets back what he needs. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. But a third stage man continues consciously cultivating the love desire for woman for world so that his consciousness is most deeply merged in her and the world he's not struggling with her as if she's a distraction to his purpose instead he realizes that her arousal allows him to give his gift more fully the way she inspires him with her light 
he doesn't just go after her and grab her to consume her and then be done with her like an obsessed first stage man, but instead he combines with her just long enough for their hearts to open and then walks away from her while desire remains. He never exploits desire to the point of depleting it, leaving himself flaccid, unable to love and enter the world and the world of women. So, what are some of the outcomes of either allowing your desire to become too diminished or acting on your desire in ways that don't bring light and fullness to the world? So let's first look at what happens if we allow our desire to diminish. So whether it is after an ejaculation, or whether it is simply because you're too exhausted, whether it is because of familiarity with your intimate partner, that you simply lose desire for your intimate partner, what happens? Well, first of all, remember what's important for the masculine in men and women is what we are attending to, whereas what is important to the feminine in men and women is how the energy is flowing. So if your energy is not flowing in love desire with your partner, she feels it. And if she is more identified with the feminine than you, she feels that lack of energy deeply. She feels, in fact, rejected by you. Your lack of desire feels like rejection to her, which, of course, because the feminine is always seeking love, makes her feel she is not getting what she really wants. So depending on her capacity to practice, she may collapse or withdraw or feel hurt, and then you're less attracted to her. And then, of course, she's more hurt and less likely to open, which makes you feel it's even more work to be with her, and so you're less likely to even want to be. So allowing yourself to become unattracted to your partner through familiarity, through repetition, through excess ejaculation, all results in a continuing distancing of your two hearts farther and farther apart. However, the same thing can happen with intense desire. As your desire grows, you'll begin to look at all women with intense desire. You'll feel desire all day. What do you do with this desire? Is it best to act on it? Can you have sex with all the women you're attracted to, for instance, and still bring light to the world? Probably not. Most men, certainly myself and most men that I've met, it's enough to be with one woman and live impeccably, to give love, to open each other's hearts. To be able to do that with more than one woman is incredibly difficult. And are you willing to be responsible for the outcome of that? Therefore, it's very important to turn your lust into a gift, to receive women's attractiveness as a form of inspiration, heart inspiration, inspiration of your soul. So you may be walking down the street, you see a woman who turns you on, her radiance, her smile, the way she moves, feels like the cosmos smiling at you. You inhale and you feel the fullness of energy in your body. Well, most men either go to head or tail with that. They go to one end of their body or the other. They either begin to fantasize in their head or they become genitally aroused. Therefore, it is important to breathe fully, circulating the energy of desire all through your body, from the top of your head down to your genitals, and then from your genitals up to the top of your head, feeling that your breath is filling and emptying your whole body with every inhalation and exhalation allowing your energy to circulate. So the actual feeling of desire, rather than it becoming targeted in head or tail, becomes coordinated by your heart. You still may have sexual fantasies in your head, and you still may be sexually aroused in your genitals, but your heart is the center. And so your heart regulates that flow of lust, that flow of desire. And when your heart feels lust, it becomes inspiration. You want to give. You're dying to give. And so it's important to turn our lust into our gifts as we cultivate the capacity to sustain desire, to sustain desire through hours and hours of lovemaking, to sustain desire through seeing the beautiful feminine in all of her forms all through the day.
as every man knows who has ever gotten the woman he has wanted, it's never as good as you thought it would be. After a few minutes or a few hours or a few days or a few years, it's just business as usual. Therefore, if you feel that by gaining the feminine because you're attracted to her, something fundamental will change, you are just wrong. Nothing changes. If you're not careful, you'll be 80 years old, still going around with the mind of a 17-year-old, thinking, I'll find that woman somewhere. I'll find the right woman. Or, my present woman will someday become the kind of woman I really want. No. All of appearance is only change. All of appearance is motion, dance. As the masculine, you are back as consciousness. You tend to identify as that which never changes. And therefore, to commit yourself in relationship feels like a reduction of freedom. Infinite consciousness is limiting itself to one woman. So the masculine is inherently resistant to committing in relationship because the masculine wants to feel freedom. It's its deepest impulse. The first stage man interprets freedom to be the freedom to have sex with whoever I want. The second stage man interprets freedom perhaps as freedom to come and go from the relationship and live his life with purpose with or without his woman. The third stage man feels that freedom means freedom from fear. It means relaxing so deeply that consciousness and its appearance are felt as one. This is not a theoretical discovery. It is as visceral as making love. It is, in fact, making love. Your relationship to this moment is your relationship to woman. Your capacity to relax so deeply that it feels like you are deeply inside your lover, literally in the midst of sexual intercourse. So your breath is full, your heart is open, your skin is relaxed, your mind is relaxed. All of those are practices that can be done in every single moment. This moment can be embraced as a woman, loved as a woman. And when you feel turned off by this moment, it is the same practice as when you are turned off by your woman. Feel your deepest purpose. What are you here for? How do you give that deepest purpose to this woman who no longer turns you on? How do you give this purpose to this world which may no longer turn you on? As a masculine force in this world, how do we continue offering our gifts even when in the moment our lesser desires are repulsed by what appears, by our woman and by the world? The way of the superior man is about feeling what is always true, which is love or consciousness. They are the same. Love or consciousness is the nature of this moment, and it wants to be expressed through this moment. Your obligation as a masculine identified human character is to enter the moment and open it as consciousness or love, to enter your woman and open her as consciousness and love. She wants this from you. The reason she wants your dark side is not because she's attracted to murderers and killers. It's because sometimes the world needs a man willing to take a stand and open the world in love. And sometimes she needs her man to take a stand and open her in love. She needs your dark, strong energy to open her. So she knows that without that killer for love within you, there'll be many days where she's sitting alone and you're off doing your thing and you're afraid to step into her storm and open her. She'll know that without that killer within you, you'll be afraid to enter the world and do battle for the sake of love in those moments when necessary. If you allow your desire to become so small, if you deplete yourself continuously through building up stress and releasing it, through masturbation, through watching TV, through throwing off your energy, through work, talking, reading, all the things we do to occupy our time that aren't really bringing light into the world and also aren't really recreational, regenerating light, but instead are simply distractions. 
if we allow ourselves to be distracted, then we begin to feel depleted and we go through life in a mediocre way. We do have a sense of what we're here for in the world, but we also know it's very difficult. The world is motion. To enter that motion is a ride and it ends in death. No one has succeeded in bringing into life the love they wanted to. Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, whoever you want to look at as a character in history who has done their best to bring love, to bring consciousness into the world, has had very limited success. So will you. That is, if you are looking for a result in your giving, you will be disappointed. The only result you will have in your giving is death. You will die giving. Your choice is, do you want to die giving everything, giving your gifts, or do you want to die still holding back, flaccid, unable to give everything, because you can't even get it up? That's your choice. And if you make the choice to die giving, then you make the choice to approach the feminine, to approach your woman, and approach the world as something to be embraced, something to be made love with, something that you in fact are. And when you relax enough to feel that you are her, that there is no separation, then all obsession and all distraction dissolve open in the revelation that she is your light and you are her depth and there is no difference and together you and your partner together consciousness and light are already merged nothing needs to be done except the dance itself continues and as the superior man feels it is our obligation to dance with as much artistry, relaxation, and humor as possible, because it all disappears, and our gift is in the giving. At our core is our heart. Our heart is a feeling organ. By feeling, I don't necessarily mean emotional feelings only. I mean the capacity to feel entirely to feel nature, to feel the wind, to feel other people's sensations, to feel beauty, to feel space itself. The main practice of the superior man is the practice of feeling. For some men, they have difficulty grasping exactly what does feeling mean, if not simply emotions. The way I'm using the word feeling is very similar to way a hunter or fisherman would use the word feeling in trying to feel where the animals are or feel where the fish are. It's very difficult to describe, but the difference between, say, an excellent fisherman and a beginning fisherman has to do with an ability to feel where the fish are. You cannot see them on the surface of the water, but with practice over years of time, men can develop an uncanny ability to feel where the fish or animals that they seek are, even though they can't see them. Well, in the same way, we can cultivate the capacity to feel how energy is moving through our partners. We can cultivate our capacity to feel what other people are feeling emotionally and physically and even mentally. It does take years of practice, just like becoming a good fisherman or a good hunter would, but you can start right now. So if you're listening to this in a place where you can close your eyes, sit down, and relax, find a comfortable place, sit, allow your spine to remain elongated, so your chest is not hunched over. And relax your whole body as much as you can, but not going limp. You're relaxing more like a cat is relaxed as it stalks its prey. 
like a dancer is relaxed in the middle of a leap. So you are relaxed, but not limp, alive and relaxed. Breath is the interface between consciousness and energy. Breath is the key for transmitting your consciousness both to other people and to your lover in sexual moments. So in this moment, with your eyes closed, sitting in a comfortable way, with your spine gently elongated so you're not hunched over, begin to feel your breath just as you would begin to feel where the animals are in the forest or where the fish are under the water. So there are unseen dimensions to your breath that over time you can cultivate awareness of, a feeling awareness of depth, hidden creatures, hidden motions, hidden currents of energy. So begin feeling the quality of your breath. And for a moment, concentrate on your inhalation. So as you inhale, as breath comes into your nose and down into your lungs, relax your belly. So without changing the pace of your breathing, you're breathing at a natural rhythm. As you inhale, allow your belly to gently expand. Many of us carry tension in the front of our body, in our belly, in our genitals, in our solar plexus, around our heart, around our throat. We carry tension in our jaw, in our eyes, in the temples, our head. That tension is a way of feeling separate and it is a way that we reinforce the sense of being separate and alone rather than already merged consciousness and energy alive as conscious light. So as you inhale, soften the front of your body. Again, softening does not mean limpness or weakness. Soft like a tiger walking through the jungle. So as you inhale, Allow your belly to soften so it expands with breath. And now exhale any way you choose right now. So with every inhalation, your belly is expanding. And then as you exhale, your belly comes in a little bit. And then with the next inhalation, your belly expands full and round. Your belly can become pregnant with breath force. So over time, minutes of practice, hours of practice, days and years of practice, your entire body can become filled with breath with every inhalation. You receive breath. You receive life force through the inhalation. And it is this life force that also fills your genitals as an erection. The inability to achieve or maintain an erection is the inability to inhale fully. So as we inhale, our entire body becomes full of energy, something like an erection. That is, our body doesn't become rigid, but it becomes firm and full, like a water balloon full. So our whole body becomes full of breath energy as we learn to receive through the inhalation. So the emotional quality associated with the inhalation is one of complete and active reception. Yes, I am receiving life down into my belly, down into my genitals, down into my feet and toes. It may take you months to feel the inhaled breath filling your belly, genitals, and even feet. But with practice, you can fill your entire body with every inhalation. At this point, 
If your mouth is open at all, gently close your mouth so your lips are together and allow your tongue to rest gently on the roof of your mouth. It can rest anywhere on the roof of your mouth. The tip of your tongue may be behind your front teeth. The tip of your tongue may be in the back of your throat. The flat middle part of your tongue may be gently resting on the roof of your mouth. With time you can experiment, but for now, simply rest part of your tongue on the roof of your mouth, whatever feels most relaxed and easy for you. Your tongue connects a circuit of energy from your head down through your throat into your belly. When your mouth is open and you are eating or speaking, you break that circuit of energy and you become more limp, more depleted of energy. So in general, throughout the day and throughout lovemaking, Allow your tongue to rest gently on the roof of your mouth, the upper palate, so that a connection can be made, bringing the energy down from the head, through the throat, through the heart, down into the belly and genitals. If you open your mouth, use your mouth consciously. For instance, during lovemaking, you can use your tongue to finish circuits of energy with your partner. You can use your tongue to bring pleasure and openness to your partner. You can use your tongue to speak words of love and beauty. But if you choose not to use your tongue in those ways, simply allow your tongue to rest on your upper palate to complete the circuitry internal to your body. So now, with every inhalation, we are emotionally receiving energy down into our body and especially our genitals. Over time, with practice, you can inhale so deeply that it feels like you are caressing your genitals with the inhalation, a kind of solo yogic practice of self-stimulation through breath in order to enhance your energy flow. So at this point, as you inhale, not only is your belly expanding with every inhalation, but also feel as if you're beginning to caress your genitals with every inhalation. So you begin to caress your genitals with the breath itself. The quality of inhalation is one of bringing energy to the genitals. You may be feeling a little bit of arousal, some tingling, a little energy, or you may feel nothing at all. You may in fact feel numbness or constriction in the belly. You may need to spend time breathing in this way, months of practice until that opens up and you can truly bring energy to your genitals with breath. You may choose to get various forms of physical therapy, yogic work, and other forms of therapy to help your body and emotions open. At this point, we're inhaling, caressing our own genitals with every inhalation. The inhalation is our first breath as a baby. We are born, and instead of breathing through our umbilical cord, our belly button, we take our first inhalation, and then we exhale. So the first breath that fills us with life is an inhalation and the last breath of our life is an exhalation when we leave our body. There are many traditional practices for practicing exhaling and leaving the body. Often the feeling is one of relaxing upward, up the spine and out the top of the head. So now we are inhaling gently and fully, filling the belly and genitals, caressing, stimulating our own genitals with breath. And now we're also adding the feeling that with every exhalation, we surrender and release life. We willingly die. We let go entirely. And as we exhale, we just feel our letting go up our spine, up out the top of our head. So as a practice now, as you inhale, fill the belly and genitals. And as you exhale, 
Allow your attention to rise up to a few feet above your head. Allow your breath to rise up and out of your nose. You may even choose with your eyes closed to allow your eyes to turn up slightly as you exhale. So everything is going up as you exhale. Your attention is going upward to focus slightly above your head. Your energy is going upward. And you may feel that as a kind of tingling in your spine or sensations, vibrations, current of energy, or simply like champagne bubbles rising up your spine, a kind of shiver up the spine. Our eyes can roll gently upwards as we exhale. So the two feelings and breath we are working with right now, is the inhale through the nose, mouth closed, tongue on the upper palate, allowing our inhaled breath energy to fill our belly like charging a battery because our belly contains and holds our life force. And then further, allowing arousal of our genitals through breath caress. And then once we have filled our body, maybe even down to our feet, once we can breathe into our genitals, when we have filled our body through inhaling and receiving the yes of life force, we surrender all hold on life. We surrender and let go of all hold on all relationships. And we even surrender our hold on our own body. And we exhale and surrender as if dying to this entire moment. We exhale and let go and allow ourselves to go up and out, up and out, up and out. And then we wait until the next inhalation comes filling our body with life force, filling our genital with arousal, filling our feet even with living energy. So every life force inhalation is as if we are being born, filling our body. And every exhalation is a kind of surrender, an emotional release, our death. So every inhalation and exhalation, every cycle of breath replicates our complete life being born, inhaling, incarnating, exhaling, and leaving the body with every breath. So we are breathing, inhaling, filling the body with breath, exhaling, releasing, letting the breath go up. And just continuing breathing in this way, well, we feel the core of our heart. So our heart is approximately midway between our genitals and the top of our head. So the breath is circling around our heart with the heart at the center. If our hearts are tense, our breath energy implodes and we focus on our own thoughts and feelings, our own sensations. We become riveted on our self. In our practice of being a superior man, we learn to feel beyond our own thoughts. We learn to feel beyond our own bodily sensations. We learn to feel beyond our own emotions. We do not ignore them. We include them in what we feel, but we feel far beyond them. So in this moment, doing your best to continue breathing as we just did, inhaling, softening the front of the body, filling the belly and genitals, exhaling, feeling upward, rolling the eyes upward, surrendering all hold on life until our inhalation comes in again and we are breathed by something larger than us in the circle of breath around our heart. As that breath practice continues, from your heart, feel the space around you. Feel the actual air the space around you. Feel in front of you. Even though your eyes are still closed, feel the space in front of you. Feel the space behind you. Space is feeling. Space itself is alive as feeling. With practice, it feels as if you are in the water, underwater, in an ocean. Space becomes like liquid. So as people move through space, they ripple the liquid and you feel those ripples moving through you. 
That's how you find the fish underwater. That's how you find the animals in the forest. That's how you feel where the people are on the basketball court or where your children are in the heart, in the house, by feeling space. So the practice of feeling the space around you as if it were water, alive, rippling with motion, is a practice that can be cultivated as any basketball player or parent knows. So in this moment, you're feeling the space in front of you. Without opening your eyes, can you feel where the wall is in front of you? If you are indoors, is the wall six feet away from you, 20 feet away from you? Feel behind you. Are there objects in the space behind you? Are there chairs or tables? Are there people in the room? Feel to the left of you and the right of you. Feel upward toward the ceiling and into the sky. Feel downward into the earth. Again, at first, it may feel like nothing. You may go, well, I don't know what that means. Feel downward. There's nothing there. But again, with practice, just like a fisherman, a hunter, a parent, a basketball player, you can feel with nuance. It does take practice, and we are beginning now. So far, our breath practice is to receive the inhalation down into the belly and genitals, to release and surrender all hold on life, exhaling upward, feeling upward. And then from our heart, the core of our breath, we are feeling outward in all directions. This becomes the central practice of the body in the way of the superior man. A wide open body, full of life force, also completely willing to let go of life force, and feeling in all directions completely, not shielding your heart, not getting lost in your head or genitals, but instead feeling from the heart into space. So for a moment, feel space all around you. Feel its texture, its thickness, its livingness. Imagine your lover approaching you in this water of space. As your lover approaches you, you feel the liquid between the two of you, the space becoming somewhat compressed. So there's a kind of pressure perhaps against the front of your body as your lover approaches you. Instead of targeting and focusing in on breasts or ears or something that is said, you are feeling all of space from the heart. You are feeling your partner's heart from your heart. You are feeling your partner's body from your heart. But you are also feeling all of space. And again, it may take months or years of practice to sustain that open, feeling nature of being that is space. So we're breathing fully, and now we're feeling fully. This kind of practice can be done throughout the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It can be done at night. It could be done in your dreams. It could be done in any body you find yourself in, in a dream. And it can be done sitting as you are right now, quietly by yourself. Relaxing open, feeling into space, breathing the inhale to fill the belly and genitals, exhaling and releasing all hold on life upward. As we grow in our practice, we always realize that we cannot see ourself. Just like an eyeball can never see itself, but it can only see its reflection in a mirror, you can never see yourself. You can only see your reflection in others. So at this point, if you have a partner to practice with, a simple practice partner, not an intimate partner, but just another man, 
You can be two women practicing this, two men, a man and woman, two friends, lovers, it does not matter who. Sit down with a partner and close your eyes. So you are now sitting down, facing your partner, but with your eyes closed. As you're sitting down facing your partner with your eyes closed, remember the previous practice, inhaling, filling the belly and genitals, exhaling up the spine, out the top of the head, feeling upward, and most importantly, allowing your heart to be a sense organ, feeling the living space all around you, feeling with the keenness and sensitivity of a professional basketball player, a master hunter or fisherman or a devoted parent. And now when you are ready, open your eyes and gaze into the eyes of the practice partner sitting in front of you. So you're gazing now into the eyes of your partner. Notice if you lost the breath when you opened your eyes. Did you constrict your breath? Did you forget to receive the breath down into your belly and genitals because you became distracted by your partner? Have you forgotten to release upward? And have you forgotten to feel the space all around you, even behind you, above you, and below you, as you gaze into the eyes of your partner? You're welcome to blink at any time. It's not a staring contest. You're simply gazing into the eyes of your partner so that we can expand this practice to include another human. So you are now relaxing, gazing into the eyes of your partner. It helps to make the exercise more simple if we focus on one eye of our partner instead of moving our focus back and forth from eye to eye. So at this point, if you would point to your own left eye, so take your own hand and point to your own left eye, and that's the eye you're looking into in your partner, the one they're pointing to. So look into the left eye of your partner, and your partner is looking into your left eye. In general, the left side of our body has more feminine qualities than the right side. And so looking into your partner's left eye allows the two feminine parts of you to come together. Whereas if you looked into each other's right eye, there's a slightly more masculine flavor to that, which is appropriate to certain exercises. But for this exercise, we're just simply going to look into our partner's left eye. On your own, you can practice however you would like and experiment. So you're looking into your partner's left eye, breathing fully, which means inhaling, filling the belly and genitals, exhaling up the spine up above the head and now from your heart feel threads of connection to your partner's heart so you're looking into your partner's eyes but you're feeling your partner heart to heart you're feeling your partner heart to heart and again the word feeling is used to mean the same thing that a fisherman would say when he's saying, oh, I feel there are fish here. And somebody less experienced might say, what are you talking about? We're in the middle of the ocean or in the middle of a lake. How can you tell? And the fisherman may say, I don't know, but I know I can feel the fish here. And a good fisherman is usually right. Well, in the same way, fish into your partner's heart. Feel into your partner's heart to find the deepest part of their heart, perhaps a place in their heart that they themselves might not have felt. So you're feeling deeply into your partner's heart, gazing into your partner's eyes. Your mouth is closed. Your tongue is on your upper palate. Inhale, filling the belly and genitals, exhaling up the spine out the top of the head, breathing fully, feeling your partner's heart relaxing and begin to feel now how present your partner feels with you so now we are expanding our feeling now we're not simply feeling outside of ourself but we're specifically feeling into somebody else so at this moment 
you are practicing feeling. Hmm, how present is my partner with me now? That is, how much is my partner feeling me? So you're feeling, how much is my partner feeling me? And that quality comes and goes. Your partner's presence comes and goes. So in some moments, you may feel your partner totally with you, feeling you, right with you, more intimate in feeling than you've ever been with anybody in your life, perhaps. And a few moments later, your partner may be distracted by a car sound outside or by the sound of a child asking for help outside the door, and their presence disappears. They're not feeling you at all. And what we're going to do to make this practice easy to communicate is use a simple number scale, 0 to 10. 10 means that you feel your partner is completely present with you. 0 means you feel your partner is not present at all. You might as well be sitting there with a mannequin or sitting facing a wall. There's nothing happening there, no feeling at all. That's zero. Ten is your partner is completely feeling you. You feel your partner is more present than anyone has ever felt you. That's ten. Five means, well, they're present with you in a kind of normal way, an average presence. They are feeling you, but not completely. Seven or eight would be feeling you quite intimately, quite closely and fully. Two or three would be less than average, less present than most people are with you. And it doesn't matter exactly what the numbers correspond to, as long as you know that zero means your partner's not present with you at all. Ten means you feel your partner feeling you completely, no sense of separation, none. Five means a kind of average presence. So for a few moments, you are silently going to narrate the numbers that say how present your partner is. So in your own heart, you are silently giving numbers to your partner's presence. So in your own heart, silently, you may be feeling six, six, ten, a sudden total connection, ten, and then a little less, eight, eight, and then your partner somehow pulls back a little more. Maybe they're drowsy, four, and maybe now they're just thinking of what they have to do tomorrow. They're going over their do list in their mind, and they're not feeling you at all, one, and then suddenly they realize that they're in their head, and they come back to feeling you, seven, seven, eight, three, three, six, so you are now silently narrating the numbers that correspond to how present your partner feels to you. And I will give you a moment of silence here to practice assigning numbers in your heart silently to your partner's presence. And do that for about one minute starting now, simply feeling how present your partner is and training your heart to discriminate how present they are being by assigning numbers 0 to 10, moment by moment, every few seconds you're giving another number silently. And now, it doesn't matter who begins, Perhaps you are the active partner first. If you are the active partner first, then now you will start saying your numbers out loud that correspond to your partner's presence. So we will say partner A, the first partner, begins speaking the numbers out loud. So begin now just gently with no conversation, with no small talk, without breaking the depth of the exercise, practicing being as intimate as possible heart-to-heart -heart with your practice partner, while also breathing fully, 
Inhaling, filling the belly and genitals. Exhaling, feeling upward. Allowing your heart to feel the space all around you alive, full of life and sensitivity. You are now also out loud narrating to your partner the numbers that correspond to how present you feel your partner is. So you may sound something like six, six, two, eight, eight, ten, ten, eight. Ten, four, four. So the first partner, partner A, begin narrating the numbers out loud now to your partner. That is your label for how present you feel your partner with you now. And begin labeling those numbers, labeling your partner's presence, zero to ten, starting now. And partner B, you are just listening and feeling how sensitive your partner is to you. And relax saying the numbers out loud for a moment and switch functions. So now partner B, the other partner, is beginning to narrate the numbers out loud that correspond to partner B's partner's presence. So partner B is looking into partner A's eyes, feeling partner A. How close is my partner to me? How deeply does my partner feel to me? Zero is my partner is not feeling me at all. Ten is my partner's feeling me entirely. So partner B, out loud, Begin narrating your partner's numbers of presence now. And now come to silence. So now both partners are in silence, but both partners are continuing in their heart to discriminate how present your partner feels. So your heart continues to assign numbers silently to how present your partner feels, how much they are feeling you. Ten means they're feeling you completely. There's no separation. Zero is there's a lot of separation. There's a wall between you and they're not feeling you at all. And now for the next part of this exercise, we will continue to breathe fully, inhaling down the front of our bodies, filling our belly and genitals, exhaling up the spine, feeling up above and releasing all hold on life, feeling space all around us, feeling as space, and feeling our partner's presence and assigning numbers to our partner's presence. To that practice, we now add this. When our partner's presence falls below seven, that is, if we are giving our partner a zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six, we simply raise our hand. And our raised hand means, come back to me. I need to feel you. So if we're feeling our partner below seven, you continue gazing into your partner's eyes and just raise your hand. And as you raise your hand, your hand simply is a silent call back to presence. Please come back to me. I need to feel you. So both partners now are raising their hand whenever you feel your partner is below seven to call your partner back. Please feel my heart. That's what your hand means. Come back to me. I need to feel you. If our partner is at seven or above, if our partner is feeling us that fully, seven, eight, nine, or ten, then we simply rest our hands in our lap or on our knees. And whenever we feel that wavering, even in a moment, and this is how we truly train each other, whenever we feel our partner wavering, even in a moment, we raise our hands if they drop below seven. We simply raise our hand and call our partner back with the raise of the hand. The raise of the hand means, I need to feel you more. Please feel my heart. You've drifted. I want to feel you more. 
and then you put down your hand when the connection is at seven or above. So now we are going to continue practicing the full breath, inhaling into the belly and genitals, exhaling and releasing up the spine out the top of the head, feeling the space all around us like a hunter or fisherman or parent, feeling our partner's heart, discriminating how full our partner's heart is feeling us, how present our partner's heart is with us, and indicating to our partner we need to feel your heart more by raising your hand when your partner's presence drops below seven. So for the next minute, you're feeling your partner's heart, allowing yourself to melt into unity, heart to heart. So even though there are two bodies, you are allowing yourself to melt open into your partner so you feel one love loving through two bodies, one love seeing itself in the eyes of another, love loving love, and raising your hand to call your partner back if you ever feel your partner disconnect below seven. Because you always attract to you people who are as committed as you are to opening, to serving, it is very important to learn how to give this feedback. And in this kind of formal exercise, do not be shy or hesitant to raise your hand when you feel your partner becoming less present than seven, less present than you can truly trust. So in the way of the superior man, not only do we practice solo exercises to cultivate our sense of purpose, our depth, our capacity to relax and access consciousness, but we also cultivate our capacity to share our depth with others. And instead of relying on our own sense of how much we are sharing our depth, because our eye cannot see itself, because we cannot see ourselves, we use our partner's feedback to help train ourselves to be more present, more full, more alive, more able to feel and open in unity with others. This kind of practice can be done every day for five or ten minutes, and over a few weeks of time, you will quickly learn to connect heart to heart with anyone you choose to, and amongst those you practice with, you will learn how to easily call your partner's heart back to presence so that you and your friends can practice fully as superior men and superior women awaken to loving and giving the gift of love to each other. And when you are ready to bring this exercise to a close, relax the effort of breath, relax the numbers, relax your arms so you're no longer raising your hands, and in our final moment of gazing into our partner's eyes and heart, in our final moment of allowing ourselves to merge heart to heart with our partner so there is no separation, so there's one love, loving love, the divine seeing the divine in another body, recognizing itself in the eyes and heart of another. Feeling that oneness, you can offer a simple bow to your partner or any other simple gesture that to you is your body's way of saying, thank you, I am grateful for you practicing with me. So a simple bow of gratitude to your partner now to end the exercise. And then coming back to a neutral sitting position, you can close your eyes and with your eyes closed, feel all the moments you have withheld this depth of presence from your friends and lovers in your life. Every moment you have withheld this depth of presence from your friends and lovers, you have been holding back your gift. 
holding back your gift is suffering. The way to not suffer is to always give this gift of presence in every appropriate moment with your children, with your family, with your lover and your close friends so they would all give you a 10 because anything less than 10 hurts and we are committed to offering our love and presence in the way of the superior man so rewind the tape with your eyes closed rewind the tape of instances where you withheld your love you withheld your heart from people you did love but you held back because they had hurt you, because you were tired, because you just didn't know that it was possible to offer your presence so fully. And rewinding the tape, imagine yourself with the specific lovers in your life, or your present intimate partner, or your best friend. Rewind the tape, and how would those moments be different if you had felt into their heart this deeply? So by practicing, even in your imagination, even in your memory, practicing offering this gift of love presence deeply in unity, you will be able to do it better in the future in real life. So before you stand up and end the exercise, with your eyes closed, for a few moments, imagine yourself with your lover or past lover being this present, this connected by heart. Imagine yourself with your children or your parents or your best friend who you have withheld this presence from and therefore have probably hurt. Imagine living this present with them, giving them this gift. So if you died, you would die knowing you had given everything moment by moment and everything is the depth of your consciousness. In our previous exercises, we learned how to relax deeply, to feel deeply, to feel the space around us, to breathe fully, to feel our partner, to feel how present our partner was with us, and give that feedback to our partner. This next exercise builds on those skills we have just practiced. So with a suitable partner, and this partner could be another man, another woman, a friend, an intimate partner, anyone at all, sit down, find a comfortable place to sit, with your spine elongated, your breath open, and for a moment, simply close your eyes. And we are going to do a practice to help us discover our deepest purpose. I will describe this practice one-sided, so I will describe how one partner can do it with the other, and then simply replay the segment so the other partner can repeat the exercise. And to briefly recapitulate some of our previous practices, our tongue is resting gently on our upper palate, to complete the circuitry internal to our body so breath energy can flow freely. As we inhale, we receive life and breath force down into our belly and genitals, caressing our genitals, bringing arousal with every inhale. And then with every exhale, relaxing upward, relaxing up our spine, allowing our eyes to turn upward just for a moment, letting go of everything, and then inhaling, filling life into our body once again. From our heart, the center of breath, we're feeling the space all around us, up and down, left and right, forward, back, feeling the space like water, alive. So as people move through the water, you can feel the ripples against your body and against your heart. So you're feeling the fullness of space, Breathing, inhaling life force into your body, exhaling and releasing, dying to life with every inhalation and exhalation. Now we open our eyes 
and we gaze into our partner's eyes. Again, we'll use our partner's left eye as a place to focus. So you can point to your own left eye to help your partner decide which is the left eye. That's sometimes difficult for people. So just simply point to your own left eye, and then you can gaze into your partner's left eye, the one they just pointed at. Take a moment and relax with your partner. Notice if your breath has stopped or become shallow. So even though you're gazing into your partner's eyes and feeling into your partner's heart, you continue to inhale and fill your belly and genitals and exhale and release upward. And you continue to feel the space all around you, feeling all of space alive. And you are feeling your partner and as we practiced in a previous exercise, in your heart, you are silently assigning numbers to your partner's presence. So internally, you are feeling seven, seven, ten, two. We are using a zero to ten scale, ten being completely present, no separation. You are one, zero being total separation. Your partner's not feeling you at all. Five means your partner's feeling you about average, whatever that means to you. So in this moment, you're silently giving numbers to your partner's presence. Narrating those numbers silently in your heart. So you're gazing into your partner's eyes, silently labeling their presence, breathing fully and feeling the space all around you. In a moment, you are going to ask your partner out loud, what is your deepest purpose? You will simply ask in a moment, what is your deepest purpose? And your partner will respond. So your partner will feel into their deepest heart and do their best to put into words the feeling of their deepest purpose. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong or if they may change it in the future. They're just doing their best in this moment to put into the words they can use the specific purpose that they feel they need to do or become before they die so they can die complete. Your purpose is that which you must do right now, tomorrow, the next day, next year, so that when you die, there is nothing left. You have given everything. So in a moment, you're going to ask your partner, what is your deepest purpose? And your partner is going to do their best to speak from their heart. So they may say something like, My deepest purpose is to raise a family, build a business that brings happiness to others, and write a novel. So again, you'll say, What is your deepest purpose? And your partner may say something like, Raise a family, build a business, write a novel. Now, as your partner says their deepest purpose, use your heart discrimination to assign a number to how deeply present your partner is with you. It's the same kind of feedback we gave our partner in our previous exercise. So as you listen to your partner's purpose, you're not focusing on what they say at all. Rather, you are feeling how present their heart is with you. So no matter what your partner says, the number you are giving your partner is basically how deeply their heart is with you. The reason we are doing this practice is because at 10, in unity, when someone's heart is that present, they are spontaneously living their purpose, and everything they say is coming out of their deepest heart. 
They are speaking from ten. They are speaking as unity. They are their purpose, which is unity. They are living it. And so you're simply reflecting back to your partner how deeply you feel their heart is with you as they're saying their purpose. And as you'll see, that fluctuates. So you'll say, what is your deepest purpose? And your partner may say, to start a business and write a novel. But when they say it, they pull back a little. So you feel five. So you say, five, thank you. What is your deepest purpose? You repeat the question. And your partner says, mm, well, to write a novel uh, and to build a business. And now they even feel more distant. So you say, three, what is your deepest purpose? And I'll try again. Your partner may say the same thing over and over as you give feedback on how deeply you feel their heart connected to you, or your partner may change what they're saying as they deepen. So the partner who is speaking your purpose, just allow your purpose to be spoken spontaneously. You can even experiment and say things you're not quite sure about. What you're going for is keeping your hearts in unity keeping connected fully with no separation, even while you speak your purpose, and you will find out what happens. So, we are now going to begin. Once again, you're gazing into your partner's left eye, tongue on the upper palate, inhaling into the belly and genitals, exhaling upward, feeling upward, feeling your partner's heart for mirrors while you feel all of space around you alive. And now, you will ask your partner out loud, what is your deepest purpose? Your partner will answer. You will give your partner a number to how present their heart feels with you, and then you will simply say, thank you. And again, what is your deepest purpose? To write a novel. Four. Thank you. What is your deepest purpose? Um, to have a family. Seven. Thank you. What is your deepest purpose? Um, to have a family and write a novel. Four, thank you. What is your deepest purpose? And you will just continue that process for several minutes. So begin now out loud asking your partner, what is your deepest purpose? And of course, you stay connected with their heart as deeply as you can. Listen to your partner's answers. Give your partner a number out loud and then say thank you. And again, what is your deepest purpose? So beginning now, start with, what is your deepest purpose? And begin. Try to get to the place where you're asking and speaking the purpose from 10. Try to be as specific as you can in your purpose. Everyone's purpose is to be happy and enlightened and give love. But how? through a family, through a business, through writing, through exercise. Be as specific as possible. Once again, make sure you speak your purpose in practical terms, things you can do and accomplish and be checked on. And coming to silence when you're ready. You can take this exercise deeper by asking, how are you going to live your deepest purpose tomorrow? How are you going to live your deepest purpose tomorrow? And again, your partner says specifically how. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to do half an hour of exercises. Then I'm going to make myself breakfast. Then I'm going to go to the office and have a talk with my boss and change things the way they are there. So you can ask for the next several minutes, how will you live your deepest purpose tomorrow? And your partner answers. And again, you simply give the number of how present their heart feels to you and say, thank you. How will you live your deepest purpose tomorrow? And continue just for a few minutes. So begin with the question, how will you live your deepest purpose tomorrow? And coming to silence when you're ready. These kinds of practices, reflecting to our partner 
how present we feel, how in unity we feel them as they speak the details, the specifics of how they're going to work out their deepest purpose, allows them to begin offering their deepest purpose from their depth. Obviously, if you're giving them a three, they can't possibly be speaking from their deepest purpose. They're hardly feeling you. Their deepest purpose is wide open conscious love offered to the world in specific ways. If they are not living that with you now in the speaking of it, they certainly aren't going to be able to live it in the doing of it. So this kind of exercise helps you and your partner not only refine what your deepest purpose is and how precisely you will live it tomorrow and in every day, but also help you practice remaining fully present and in unity as you speak and ultimately live your purpose moment by moment. When you have completed this exercise, and you can practice this as long as you want, 10 minutes at a time, half an hour at a time, once a day, once a month, when you have completed this exercise, as always, feel how moments in your past you might not have lived your deepest purpose or might not have offered your deepest purpose from your true depth but instead we're trying to give your deepest purpose from three or two, a closed and separate place, which is useless in terms of your deepest purpose. We all make mistakes. The superior man learns from the ongoing mistake of his life. And this is one way of learning how to speak and act your deepest purpose from your true deep heart. When you are dumb, offer a simple bow of gratitude to your partner for sharing this practice of purpose with you. There are many exercises that we can use to help explore and express our dark side lovingly for the sake of bringing love and light and consciousness to our friends and partners. This one exercise will do is specific to your intimacy. So those of you who have an intimate partner, sit down with your intimate partner and face your partner. As always, your partner can be the same sex, the opposite sex. You could be playing the masculine, the feminine. But to make it simple in my description, I'll be speaking to you as a man relating to your partner as a woman. If you do not have an intimate partner in your life, you can do this exercise sitting with your eyes closed and imagining that you're doing this exercise with a partner until you have one to practice with. This kind of exercise can also be done in a formal practice situation with a trained supervisor who knows how to lead you through this exercise. Then you can do it with a group of people who are practicing not necessarily in intimacy, but to prepare each other for their real intimacies. To use this exercise, please use it only with your real partner, as there is no living supervision, and it's best to do this with those you have established trust with. So sitting down with your real intimate partner, or sitting down and imagining yourself with a partner, for a moment close your eyes. And remember some of the basic practices of presence, and breath and feeling. And as a brief reminder, we're inhaling, filling our belly and genitals, almost caressing our genitals to bring energy to the base of our body where we often hold our energy back due to fear. So we're practicing really inhaling into the lower parts of our body, filling them with life force. As we exhale, we surrender and release upward, feeling above. And from our heart, we feel space all around us, like a fisherman would find fish under the ocean, or a hunter would search for animals in the forest, or a parent might feel his or her children throughout the house. You are feeling all of space and cultivating the capacity to feel things you cannot even see. Now open your eyes and gaze into the eyes of your partner. 
as always, notice if you've holding your breath now. Have you started holding your breath? Or are you continuing to breathe fully, inhaling into the belly and genitals, exhaling upward, continuing to feel the space alive around you, rippling with whatever motion there is? And now you are also feeling into the heart of your partner as you gently gaze into your partner's left eye. Begin to feel into your partner's heart more deeply so you can begin to feel that in her heart she is yearning to be known. She is yearning to be seen. She is yearning to feel you willing to enter her and feel her exactly how she is to feel her heart perhaps more deeply than she can. In the way of the superior man, one of the gifts you have to give to your lover is the capacity to feel her heart more deeply and in ways than she can. You're feeling it in ways that she cannot feel it. You're bringing her a reflection to her of her own heart so she can feel herself through you in ways she cannot even feel herself. She offers the same gift to you. She can feel your heart deeper than you can and reflect to you your own heart. So right now you're practicing feeling deeply into the hidden chambers of her heart, feeling into her yearning that she may even be shy, embarrassed to express. So you're feeling beneath any expressed desires into her true heart yearning that even she may be a little shy to feel. Amongst her yearning is the desire for the masculine divine to be able to enter through her resistances. She wants to be able to trust her intimate partner to be able to enter through her heart closure, her fear, her resistance, and gently but persistently enter through her shields to be able to touch and bloom her heart as love, to fill her heart that yearns for love. But to do that, you need to be strong. She will put up energetic resistance, and her heart yearns to feel your energy strong enough to lovingly embrace her as she is energetically even resisting, and lovingly, perhaps humorously, and certainly with a little darkness, enter her heart. And that is what we are going to practice now. So as we have learned in the previous exercises, begin assigning numbers to your partner's heart, zero to 10 scale. If you feel your partner's heart wide open to you, willing to receive you entirely, that's a 10. And if you feel your partner's heart's closing, that's a zero. Closing like a rock, unfeeling, is zero. So you're silently giving your partner numbers zero to 10. And now I'm speaking to your partner. So I'm speaking to the feminine playing partner. Now I'm speaking to you, the partner of a man practicing the way of the superior man. So feel into his heart right now and allow your heart to silently discriminate and silently give numbers to his heart's presence with you. So silently you are giving numbers to his heart. Ten meaning you feel his heart completely present with you, feeling you entirely. 
Zero is you don't feel his heart at all. He feels walled off and separate. Five means he feels, oh, averagely present with you, and so forth. So just to practice for about a minute, silently give numbers to his heart. How present is his heart with you? So you're training your own heart to feel, is he present? Completely present, 10. Partially present, 6. Hardly present, 2. And assign those numbers silently for the next few moments. And now, as we did in a previous exercise, the woman partner, you are now raising your hand if your man partner falls below seven. So starting now in this moment, women, simply raise your hand to call your partner back. He is practicing to be present, but like all men, he is sometimes distracted. He may be tired. He may be hungry. He may be thinking of something else. If you feel his presence falling below seven, so you really need to be giving these numbers silently in your heart. If you feel his presence falling below seven, simply raise your hand to call him back. And then keep your hand raised as long as you need to until he's back at seven or above. And when your heart would give him an eight or a seven or a nine or a ten, put down your hand until he distances his heart from you again. Now men you are going to begin to practice speaking from your dark side. I will tell you exactly what to say. And you are like an actor practicing to speak with authenticity, finding a way to speak certain lines that are real, offered from your heart with full presence. So you're practicing to speak at 10. But you may find that when you speak, you are getting a two or a four or a five from your woman, which means you need to practice because what she is feeling in real life is this, your presence. What you say is nowhere near as important as how present you are when you say it, and you're about to discover this. So, men, out loud, you are going to begin saying to your partner, I want you. Just those words. I want you. So find a place in yourself that does want a part of her. The divinity within yourself truly wants the divinity within her. So from that place, men, out loud in a moment, you are going to say, I want you. Now if her hand goes up, that means that when you said it, you dropped below seven. So while her hand is up, you don't say a word. You just gaze into her eyes and relax until she lowers her hand, which means that she's feeling you at seven or above, and then you can continue. And you're just going to say those words, I want you. And then her hand comes up because you dropped below seven. Then you sit in silence, feeling her, until she feels you feeling her, then she lowers her hand and again, I want you. This time she didn't raise her hand because she's feeling your presence. So you continue. It's like practicing speaking poetry. I want you. I want you. It's a practice. It's like a musician practicing his instrument to bring the most ecstasy through it to others. So the instrument in this case is speaking from your darker side, and we're just starting with the sentence, I want you. So begin now, men, I want you. 
and women partners simply raise your hand if he falls below seven to bring him back to presence and otherwise just listen offer your heart and enjoy the poetry of his desire just the line i want you and begin now male partner i want you And women, if he falls below seven, raise your hand. Otherwise, keep your hands down. And men, practice with that one line, I want you, as you open in unity with your partner. And coming to silence. You can practice that part of the exercise as long as you need to, to be able to speak, I want you, and remain connected at seven or above. But now we're going to go more fully into the dark side. At some point, you will probably reach the place where you are afraid to offer your love. That fear shows itself as tension. So you may notice yourself giggling or laughing or looking away or holding your breath or becoming tense. And that's a sign that the yoga has started. You've reached the place of your dark side where you close down and your partner cannot feel your heart. So in this practice, we're training the men to speak from their dark side and to stay heart to heart connected. The next sentence you will use, ma'am, is, I want you, my bitch. I want you, my bitch. So there's a little darkness there. It's said with love, with humor. I want you, my bitch. But notice if you disconnect when you say that, if she raises her hand, which is just an indication you need to practice saying that, until you can speak open-heartedly. There is a part of her that in moments wants you to be able to take her this way, wants you to be able to express your dark desires verbally and through your body. So if you close your heart when you express these desires, she won't be able to trust you. Your dark desires will then be simply abusive. To say, I want you, my bitch, with no love is simple abuse. But to say, I want you, my bitch, with complete love, is ecstatic in the right moment. So we're practicing heart-to-heart connection and speaking from the dark side. So men, feeling your partner's heart, feeling that sometimes she will need the darker expression to touch through her resistances and take her, you're practicing staying in love and saying, I want you, my bitch. And begin saying that sentence, Women, raise your hand if his heart disconnects from you below seven. Call him back with your raised hand. Men, if she raises her hands, come to silence. Breathe. Inhale into your belly and genitals. Exhale up. Feel the space around you from your heart. Feel into her heart. And when she feels your presence at seven or above and lowers her hand, begin again. I want you, my bitch. And begin now, men, I want you, my bitch. And women, raise your hand if and when necessary to call him back to presence. I want you, my bitch. Begin. And when you feel you have practiced this long enough, come to silence for a moment. And then men, how dark are you willing to speak? I want you, my bitch. I want to take you, my bitch. You are mine. I'm going to take you and lay you down and press into you and ravish you. I'm going to kill you with my love. I'm going to obliterate you with my love. How dark can you take it? In the freestyle form of this practice, men, you can practice expressing darker and darker and darker and darker words. But if you stay connected at 10, it is all the expression of love. 
If you do not stay connected, then it is simply abuse. To speak from the dark side when you're not deeply connected is abusive. It's painful. But to speak your love with that dark claiming energy, you are mine, for real, touches her heart in a way that she yearns for on occasion, that she requires on occasion to feel claimed by your heart. How dark can you take it? With practice, you will discover you can say anything from that place and have it say love. You can say, I'm going to take you and rip off your limbs and suck out your blood as I love you to death and have it feel as love. Whereas if you are not connected heart to heart, you can even say, uh, I love you, and it will not be felt as love. It is not what you say, but the energy communicated through your connection. So in the freestyle form of this practice, which you can now practice daily with your real partner, or once a week, or spontaneously for the rest of your life, you practice speaking the darkest you could speak as your partner raises her hand when she, you fall below seven, or your partner can give you the numbers out loud, seven, three, two, eight, eight, and you train yourself to offer dark love energy while staying connected. So in the last part of this exercise, find out, men, how dark you can speak and still be getting from your woman a seven or above. That is, she still feels your heart wide open with her. So speaking from the dark side, as dark as you can, Take a few moments and spontaneously, freestyle, find a way. How dark can you make it and still have her in the ecstasy of communion, heart to heart? So begin now, men, starting with perhaps, I want you, my bitch, and making it darker and darker. It's fine to use foul language, vile language even, said in total heart connection, and find out what happens. So men begin speaking the most vile love talk, staying totally connected that you can, and being trained by your woman partner who is either raising her hand when you fall below seven or out loud narrating numbers so you can practice staying heart-to-heart -heart connected while you offer your claim of her heart darkly, strongly, aggressively, ravishing her. So begin speaking from the darkest you can, bringing it darker and darker and darker. If she raises her hand, come to silence. Reconnect with her heart and continue. And so begin now, men, speaking from your darkest that you can. Ladies, raising your hand to say, quiet for a moment, reconnect to my heart. And then, ladies, lower your hand when you're ready for him to begin speaking again. So men, begin with, I want you, my bitch, and then go darker and darker and darker until she raises her hand, and then reconnect, and then proceed. So begin, men. You are mine. I want you, my bitch. As dark as you can speak, as long as she doesn't raise her hand, but as soon as she raises her hand, it's her heart's call. Feel me. Feel me. Then she'll lower her hand and begin speaking again. And women, if you want him to go even darker than he's going, you can say out loud, darker, darker, as well as raising your hand when he disconnects. So in the feedback, ladies, you can add darker if you'd like him to go darker and raise your hand when you need him to be more connected. So if she says darker, men, try darker, and if she raises her hand, come to silence, reconnect, and then go darker. So ladies, at this point, you can ask your partner darker, if you would like it darker, and raise your hand if you need him more present. So men, freestyle, speaking from your dark side, claiming her, telling her what you're going to do with her, I'm going to throw you down and rip off your clothes, lay on top of you, press you into the bed, grab your hair, pull your head back, and lick your face till you're happy.
take it as dark as you can, as open-heartedly as you can stay connected. You can practice this exercise for as long as you'd like, perhaps 10 minutes at a time. And when you have completed this exercise, come to silence, come to silence now. Now close your eyes, and as always, it's best to practice where you're weak. So with your eyes closed, remember back to a time that you withheld your darkness sexually from your woman. Remember a time where you withheld your dark love, either because you were afraid or you didn't know that you can use that part of you to touch your woman's heart. And in your memory, replay the tape so that now with your partner or your past partner that you're imagining, you're giving love, staying heart connected at 10, but you're giving love darkly, claiming her heart deeply, ravishing her open, murdering her with your love in unity. So with your eyes closed, practice, rehearse, offering your dark love in real moments that you can remember you did not offer it in your intimate life. Take a moment and replay the past, this time practicing how you know now you can use your dark energy to go through the resistance of your lover and touch her heart as long as your heart is connected to hers. When you have finished replaying your memories, this time practicing fully, offering your love to your partner in a way that will meet her energy when she needs it. So when she gives you big energy, you can give her big love energy back and crush her in your loving. Open your eyes, gaze into your partner's eyes, man and woman. Feel the gratitude you have in your heart for your partner being willing to serve you in this way. And men and women, both partners, offer a simple bow or gesture of gratitude to bring this practice to a close. In the way of the superior man, we live from our sense of purpose. We offer our depth of consciousness, light and dark. We live for the service of our partner and to bring life light, love, and consciousness to this earth. The earth and women will often resist us and even fight. And we turn every fight into a dance, a dance of love, where our freedom and love are liberated for the sake of all beings. So may all our practices always serve the heart liberation of all beings.